I will uh, call the select board meeting select board meeting of January 8th to order at 6.32 p.m. Uh, Mr. Wald is, is uh, not with us at this moment, may or may not join us later. We're not sure he's traveling today, and so we're not sure if he's made it back into town. So we'll continue with him without him at the moment. Um, so we begin with opening remarks, announcements, and agenda review. I'll start with the agenda review piece. Is there anything on the agenda that we need to add or change in any way at this point? Um, I know we've got some folks here for public comment. Anything? Uh, the only thing I would request is that we just have a couple of minutes fairly early on to uh, review the motion sheet because we did not have the motion sheet previously and uh, it's usually helpful to do that in advance. All right. Do but to... uh, if we could do public comment, of course. Okay. All right. So um, who's <coughs> here for public comment? Not related to an agenda item, I presume. You don't think so? That we'll, think we'll presume that's not the case. Except. Okay, but we may move you ahead because I believe I know why you're here as well. Yes. And that's what I was going to ask you about actually is I know we have an item on the consent calendar that I was planning to ask to have removed from the consent calendar, but it's not, you know, it's not a timed item or whatever. And right. so depending on what other things you've got in the pipeline for what we need to do when, I wondered if we could move that up since we know at least one person's here associated with that who could answer questions for us. So what I was hoping to do with regard to that was have him be the last person to public comment and we at least hear from him and then we might take up the actual action okay. later. But we could take it up then as well. So that could work. Cool. But we'll begin. Thank so you. we have just the two of you for public comment. Is that correct? So we'll begin with you. So if you'd step to the microphone, introduce us, uh, introduce yourself to us and yep. the larger viewing audience and sure. tell us what you need to share. One thing I will share with you is we generally sort of just take information during public comment. Uh, we don't generally react or, or, or uh, provide, you know, or ask questions or that sort of thing. We just sort of take it in and, and uh, we do uh, want to hear from you. So if you would thank you so much. Um, good evening. I'm Ariella Schwell. I'm resident of Amherst and mom of two children in Crocker Farm School. I'm here to talk about an issue that has been on the minds of school staff and parents for a number of years, which is the use of the three Amherst Elementary schools as voting sites and how it impacts the safety of our students. We are concerned about having the schools open to a large number of people with unfettered access to the building while school is underway. The presence of a sole constable in the building, in our minds, is inadequate. Particularly in Crocker Farm, given the structure of the building, voters lining up outside the gym can easily see and converse with, if they choose, Crocker Farm pupils and teachers going about their business in the hallways. There is nothing to prevent a voter from leaving the queue to go further into the building. Moreover, there is no system in place that would prevent a member of the public who is not a voter in our precinct, precinct from entering the building on election day under false pretenses. With these concerns in mind, I was pleased to see that the school committee passed the next school calendar of 2018-2019 with a curriculum day for teachers on the November election day, thereby insulating students from the impact of thousands of voters descending on the Amherst schools. <coughs> we feel it's an important step to ensuring safety in the building. However, it's crucial to also consider smaller local elections and how to create a permanent plan to ensure that all future election days be held without children in the building. In March of 2018, there will be a local election on a day when the students will be there. Because it's only a few months away and too late to convert into a curriculum day, we strongly urge you to coordinate with the Amherst Police Department and the school administration to provide police presence at the entrance and within the buildings at all three schools. Finally, we believe a long-term solution, ultimately removing all voting from the schools, is really necessary. Even if classes are not in session when voting takes place, there are security issues to be considered. It is possible that safety hazards caused or introduced during voting hours could go unnoticed and then pose a risk to school building security and child safety the following day. Thank you so much for allowing me some time to convey our concerns. I look forward to further discussion about how we can come together as a community to create safe learning environments for our children. Thank you so much. Thank you. So if you come forward for us, please. Yeah, 
should so be an additional packet. I think we did receive those things, but also I think our motion sheet has the motion with what I'm hoping is the hours you were suggesting. <laughs> yes, please. My name is George. I'm the general manager of Amherst Cinema. Thank you. Uh, and so we had put uh, forth a proposal to adjust our serving hours for beer and wine. Um, they're currently set right now 4 to 10 p.m. And uh, we regularly have um, our National Theater Live and ballet productions, which are uh, sometimes 1230, um, but generally they're a little, a little later, 2 o'clock. And that audience um, frequently is asking for for wine. Um, and it does create some confusion to have a limited time in which we can serve for our patrons, um, which adds to some tension at the, bo at the point of sale, um, in addition to some uh, setup and procedural stuff for us in internally. So we were hoping to extend those hours. We have um, a long and clean record of service. Um, and generally, our clientele is not the party in crowd, so it's, I don't think it poses any real risk. Um, so our ask was to extend our hours. I had just said to our business hours, and that was read as 9 a.m., but we don't, we don't really have a need to serve that early. Um, I can't imagine a situation where that would be, be required, but um, I want to just present that and, and ask for your consideration. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Brewer, you may so want to stay <laughs> in case they This, this was an <laughs> odd situation <laughs> in that. Stay up here. We had, we had very little information in our Friday packet because of the weather and various other reasons, and so we didn't have very much information. We did receive a number of materials emailed to us this afternoon, but they do not include the revised state, the, the email did, but the paper copies do not include the revised statement that was made um, about the hours that were requested, so that didn't make it into the pile of photocopies. And um, does somebody have that relatively handy from the email earlier? The motion sheet actually, I think, has the hours listed, which is not on anything else, I think. But George submitted a new letter. Actually. Yeah, that was yeah. this afternoon about exactly. four. Exactly, yeah. and although all the other things we got emailed. I mean, for ease, I'm comfortable with 9 to 1. We, we don't open our box office until usually the earliest is 10 a.m. on weekends. Um, if it's just easier for that, they went with our, our hours of operation. Um, but we wouldn't be serving them. But if, if, it, if it's convenient for you all. Yes. It's, it's not here, and so it's in our email. It's not here, though. Just I can go make copies if um, you'd like. But perhaps in the meantime, I guess I would, I would ask Mr. Slaughter for some direction as to how we want to do this, because originally, as you, I appreciated what you did earlier in terms of making it the last public comment item. Do you want to try and now treat this as an agenda item now that we are? working on as pulled out of the consent calendar or were there other things that we needed to do at this particular point in the evening? Because I may have more questions as the conversation unfolds. Um, well, I, I don't know that we need to take a long time with it at this moment. Uh, it may be that we're not ready to take action is one thing that we have to determine ourselves, but also I think it's fine if we want to take this up at this moment um, just because we have uh, our guests here as well as um, uh, some of the other materials here and we're talking about it now so it might be just efficient to sort of talk about it at the moment um, and then come back to the other things fairly quickly but so maybe if I can make this statement that'll help you decide what sure. you're doing next so um, I don't believe we should take action tonight we had nowhere near adequate information in the packet over the weekend to think about what this means um, it is entirely different to know that under Mass General Law, service can be done between 11 a.m. and 11 p.m. And the original application said 4 p.m. And saying 9 o'clock but probably won't serve then is just not sensible to me in terms of how I can think things through in terms of what we do in other parts of the community. So although I certainly appreciate the service at Amherst Cinema associated with this, and I've been pleased that we've been able to do this, and I understand earlier than four, because there are certainly matinees before then in addition to the events that they've mentioned. Um, for one, I don't think we had still have adequate information as to what our window or what our envelope of what we're allowed to say yes or no to is. And we don't have substantial documentation. We have a sentence from 
the applicant that's verbally that says it's been going well. I presume it's been going well because Mr. L our Chief Livingstone did not say anything when we were doing the, but I, I don't have the Chief's opinion on this. Mm -hmm. We don't have anyone else in town who serves alcohol at 9 a.m. Um, or 10.30 a.m. So I'm, I'm just not ready to make a decision yet. That's fair enough. I think, uh, so I think there were a couple questions that this raised for us today that are not your fault, but they did bring forward some questions we have on our own as far as how we're tracking certain aspects of, of our licenses. And, and uh, so it begged a few questions that made us dig a little deeper or start to try to dig a little deeper into what's, there's what's allowable by law, what we have traditionally done as far as keeping track of things, what we probably ought to do regarding tracking things because, uh, you know, uh, we've often tied, uh, kept track of like the common victual license, but you can have that be a much broader time frame than the actual service of alcohol. So recognizing a few gaps in our own coverage of this, but um, how do the other two members feel about whether we should, whether we, if we delayed, would that be preferable or would, would you rather pick this up this evening? I'm open to, yes. I don't, I don't mind delaying. I don't know if there was a particular program coming up that um, it would be a hardship if we wait till our next meeting. You know, like sometimes you have a special program coming yeah. and if we were aware of that, we could, we could do something about that. But I think getting our own ducks in, in order makes sense, as Mr. Spiro said, and you know, sort of suggests to me the, the larger thing we've talked about from time to time about alcohol policies is needing to have a sort of, you know, our little guidebook that helps us do this. And if our tracking needs to be improved, then to wake up to do that. Um, it's fine that you said, well, our, our clientele don't cause trouble or whatever that was, but <laughs> I, don't th I don't think we can make a decision based on that. I'd, I'd like to make decisions that are um, consistent across all establishments and not have to decide if oh, I like these patrons because they're gray hair like I do or, <laughs> or these other patrons who, you know. So I think we should stay away from, oh, well, this is, this is a nice place, so we just whatever they want. And just do it by the book because I think then we're on solid ground. So it's likely that the next time we'd be able to take this up would be the 22nd. So, um, I, I won't be in town, but I, we can either come back for that necessarily. Okay. If we have any questions that I think we can sort of bring those to you via email or whatever and get those answered, uh, you know, it, it, it'll probably be a non event <laughs> <laughs> yeah. on the 22nd, but we do want to get ourselves straightened out as far as hours and stuff. And if, as our membership sort of looks at this a little more closely and has questions, I think we can, we'll bring those back to you. Sure. Steinberg, did you have something to say? I'm not exactly convinced of the reason that's being put forward yet now for the amended change when we were talking about the original request that was going to 9 a.m. <coughs> I uh, was raising similar questions, but the amended request is 12.30 p.m. opening Monday through Friday, 11 a.m. on Saturday, and noon on Sunday. And I think that other establishments that um, are selling liquor are selling at those hours on those days of the week because they serve lunch crowds. And we just on um, Sunday, of course, been doing some modifications. So I. Um, I, I guess I, with the looking at it in terms of the amended request, I think I want a little bit more explanation as to why we can't make a decision tonight. If I may add, it, 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 it also be proving a negative. There is there is no documentation on incidents for me to provide because there have been none. So, uh, if you were looking for that, I would come back basically with the same information for you. I, I don't have anything to show you. I can give you an empty incident log, and I can give you a. Uh, a clear history with the police department. I understand that a statement from them is valuable, but uh, to your point, there, there would be no additional information coming from me outside of r specific requests that you made that I could answer um, in terms of our clientele or, or there being a, a judgment call being made. The judgment call would be based on that information, if that's helpful. The purpose 
of the open meeting law is multifold, but one is so that the public knows what we're doing. And the only thing the public had to go on based on our Friday list of topics 48 hours ahead of time was the idea of them opening at 9. Now, the fact that we didn't hear from anyone does not mean that they don't have an opinion about opening at 12.30. I just don't see any reason why we would rush this through based on a sentence that was provided to us this afternoon when we had no information in our packet as to what our choices were. I'm still not convinced the entire select board knows what our choices are and what our alternatives are, and they may well be fine with this, but not knowing what the choices, what our alternatives are, just doesn't work well for me process-wise. And I would like to hear from Chief Livingstone to see if he has any concerns, which I seriously doubt he would have given the exact circumstances Mr. Steinberg spoke to. So although we haven't taken a formal vote, it sounds as though. <laughs> I'm too confused to vote. Right, well, I, I think, I think that's the thing for, most, for I, us as well, and I think that's partly to, to Ms. Brewer's point, is that the, the details have come late to us, and so as far as, you know, for notice to the public as a, as a piece of this as well. Yeah. That's part of why I th I'm sort of leaning toward let's wait a little bit. The confusion so stems from me me using the language of hours of operation because we don't have consistent opening and closing times at our box office because the length of films determines uh, when our box office opens for the first time and when it closes. So I was referring to the, to the hours of operation as um, customer facing. So when patrons would be in the lobby and buying alcohol and that was taken understandably by Deborah as our total hours of operation, which includes our, our um, administrative and office staff who are right, there at right. 7, 8 in the morning. Right. Um, so yeah, the, the, what's listed here is much more broad, but what we're asking is actually much more restrictive. So right. um, yeah, so I, I do. think that's part of it on our part as far as making sure we have that right. And then also just, yeah. again, notice to the public as a whole. So I think we'll, yes. Could we ask, uh, would you just state exactly what your, the hours that you're seeking, be very clear about that right now so we can write these down? Sure. Monday to Friday, 12.30 to, I put 1 a.m., but again, it's rare we're open that late. So I, I came here ready to discuss and, and you know, bargain, basically. Um, but 1 a.m., and, and a lot of this is also just coming from an operational perspective for me, thinking of having our staff come in. And when you open, it's easier just to open everything. And then when you leave, to close everything as opposed to these piecemeal okay. things. Um, so 12.30 to 1 a.m. on uh, weekdays, and then on Saturday, it would be 10.30, and Sunday, I understand it's 12. 10.30 and, to 1 a.m.? Yes, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. to 1 a.m., and then Sunday, um, noon to 1 a.m. And then, if I, if I, Mr. Chair, if there's uh, other material, I, I hear that we, you'd like to get something from Chief Livingstone. Is there anything else that you would need to help you make a decision next time, if you, don't cho if you choose not to vote tonight? So one, uh, another piece to be clear, right now alcohol service is taking place between 4 p.m. and 10.30 p.m. Correct, yeah. And it's just beer and wine. There isn't um, liquor. Well, I'm aware of that. I think someone had Because we didn't give you the other kind no, of license, yeah. <laughs> so therefore you'd best not be yeah. selling anything <laughs> other than beer and wine. We haven't had anyone complain about that. No one. Um, the other question I guess I have is this isn't a restaurant and this isn't a place that serves meals, and they do have a common VIC, and because we did that, we did that, uh, but they also have a general license that doesn't require a common VIC, so it's a little bit different than a restaurant, but it's not, and it's certainly not a bar, but now it's approaching bar hours, and I guess I'm still not clear on why it needs to change from 10.30 to 1 a.m. beyond the simplicity of closing everything at one time. So, sorry, if I Actually, 10.30, would all, we, we actually close our concession stand at 10.30. Um, so oh. that, that actually would be fine. So that's when they stop serving food such as popcorn. But that's... I'm just, I'm just saying. So I'm trying to understand. This concession stand, I mean, you have been very responsible. It is my understanding, my observation and my understanding that you are not you know, serving people who are wandering and off the street. And... Um, unless they really want to buy the delicious popcorn. But it's that you are going to be, you already closed the concession stand at 10.30. Correct. For whatever event. So even if you have a late movie, which yep. you don't frequently have, but sometimes, um, you are not continuing to serve alcohol until 12.30. You're actually going to stop. 
because right. the whole thing's going to be closed. So you're really going from instead of four to ten thirty, you're going from twelve thirty to ten thirty, ten thirty that would to ten thirty, yeah. and twelve to ten thirty. Yeah. See, this is all becoming clear now. So that makes more sense to me in terms of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and so I'm feeling better about that. So I don't feel like I need like another back and forth via email associated with that. If that would be, that's at least hours I'm comfortable with, but I would just like to, I can't imagine chief, living, but we, when we extend hours, it seems appropriate to ask him. So I guess, uh, um, just to clarify what has been already said, but I'll say it again so that Mr. Myers can confirm it, and that is that people don't come in literally off the street to purchase because you have to have purchased a ticket for a performance to get to the stand or you not. Don't. No, technically that's not, that doesn't happen, yeah. but that's not, there's no prohibition against someone getting to that point. People do come in actually more than you would imagine and just buy popcorn and go home. It's, it's really it's good. I have done common. that. <laughs> Um, but we haven't had any instances of that, but it's not to say it couldn't happen. Um, that being said, we don't have anywhere for a person without a ticket to drink. Um, we, 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 the lobby is so small, we can't accommodate um, people just standing at our counter and drinking. They have to have somewhere to go with it. And we actually do, uh, when selling drinks, ask them where they're going because we have um, a satellite theater that's about 20 feet away from our licensed premise. So we make sure that those people who are purchasing aren't leaving the building because that they're not allowed to leave the building with it. So we do actually engage with the customer who's coming in um, when they purchase. So I guess I've done one more question. Um, what are, can you describe just for the board's benefit um, your procedures for um, making sure that you're um, serving to people who are legally allowed to purchase alcohol due to age or um, uh, inebriation? We have uh, currently all staff undergoes TIPS training, which is a, a certification process that walks them through um, both the liability um, from overserving and prepares them to not overserve. Um, so everybody is trained, everybody's over 18, and we ID everybody, which is something I'm actually trying to talk to the police about possibly changing that policy because right now, if someone comes in and buys a, a senior ticket, which means they're over 65, we then ID them at the, at the point of sale for, for beer and wine which feels a little redundant, but currently we ID everybody and everybody who is serving is trained and certified. Thank you. Ms. Brown. You don't have a choice on that. That's an ABCC requirement. <laughs> you, have to, you have to card them again at the point of sale. My understanding is if you're over 35, you don't have to card someone if you well, appear to be over 35. Well, <laughs> right, if you want the protection of right, yeah. saying that you checked the ID. Right, you don't have to card anybody for we that ID matter. Our executive you just have to director. hope that you yeah. guessed right on everybody's <laughs> age. But, um, right. Well, police cards are one. Yeah. Yeah. And they are a blessing for that because <laughs> the people are familiar with that experience. So we're like, right. like just like true. Whole Foods. So I guess it's still up to the board if we, or, yes. So another way we could do this tonight, if other people are less confused now that we have a lot more additional information, and the hours are now, in fact, aside from one half hour on Saturday, are within Mass General Law requirements anyway, where we actually can't say no, is my understanding, um, is we could potentially go ahead and say yes with the understanding that if Chief Livingstone had any, con we, wouldn't, we wouldn't finish the paper. Ms. Puppel would just do the usual thing with him. Yeah, well, we have a lot more information now. <laughs> Nine o'clock in the morning, <laughs> service of beer and wine changed a lot over the course of this conversation. So, um, And if there's an issue with that 10, 1030, that was, I was just thinking in terms of when people were there. I'm, I'm, we're very happy to. That's what works on Saturday. Yeah. So I would entertain a motion if you wanted to make one. <laughs> so what it does it what does it say on the motion sheet? It's on the second page, number four there. If you want to Monday through Friday, twelve thirty p.m. So before I make the motion, if I do, I change it from twelve thirty p.m. to ten thirty p.m. Well, Monday through Friday, it's still twelve thirty. 
it's on Saturday, the 11 a.m. that's written yes, there. Yes, I'm to saying 10:30. 2, 10, 30 p.m. instead of 2, oh. 1 a.m. Yeah, and then eliminate in the following day. Yes. And Saturday, 10.30 a.m. to 10.30 p.m., taking out the day following. And Sunday, 12 p.m. to 10.30 p.m., taking out the day following. Um, we never say contingent because that's, like, not really a thing. But what have we said we've said this before about other like one days that come in quickly etc um, the understanding is we won't S subject to positive um, um, report from the police chief maybe something like that subject to lack of concern or <laughs> <laughs> however positive report work well enough for people you want to wordsmith that differently Subject to report from chief police. Yeah, I'd take the word positive. All right, so I move for, I'm not sure how this is written. I move that for Amherst Cinema Wine and Malt Liquor License, whose number I want to include in here, but isn't on here, but is someplace on here, because I know we looked at it earlier today when we got the email. It's up in the corner. It is zero zero two four three zeros one zero five. Except on this one. Liquor license zero zero two four zero 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 one one zero five. Twenty eight Amity Street. A change of hours of of operation. Right, because it's for the liquor license. From Monday through Sunday, four p.m. to ten thirty p.m. To Monday through Friday. 12.30 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. Saturday, 10.30 a.m. to 10.30 p.m. And Sunday, 12 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. Subject to report from Chief of Police. Is there a second? Second. Excellent. Is there further discussion? <laughs> Hearing none, all those in favor, <laughs> please say aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous, four to zero. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Can I, I, I just say one thing for Mr. Um, one thing that we observed in a prior incident within the community that came to the attention and required action from this board was um, circumstances of people who appear to be of age purchasing um, alcohol and then conveying it to people who are underage and uh, not and then sort of evading the age limit and uh, it's obviously a very difficult issue um, but as you were describing your process um, i just hope that you also have at least some thought to being vigilant for that possibility and in particular looking out for people who are clearly buying more than for their own individual consumption at the stand without anyone else present. I appreciate that concern. And we, we don't allow third party sales. Every, every drink has to go to an ID holding patron. And uh, we do exercise discretion in who can and cannot drink. Um, we have cut off patrons who we've never served. Um, and we've made a determination at a point where we've served someone and we won't serve them again. Um, and we would certainly do that if we thought someone was serving. Um, we had an instance where someone said, oh, I don't have an ID. And then the friend out loud said, I'll buy it for you. I said, sorry, we won't allow that. So we, d we do make those um, judgment calls, and our staff is trained for that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank, you. <coughs> Thank you. Is there further public comment? Please step up if there is. Step up. I have a very good voice. <laughs> I can barely hear you guys, and I'm only a few feet away. It's for the recording. So make sure that oh, you. Yeah, uh, I still have a very good voice. <laughs> so make sure you mention your name for Jennifer the. Goldman. Thank you. And go right ahead. Thank you. One quick little one. Just getting into the building, I noticed the um, elevator has inspection has ins expired. <laughs> expired actually on New Year's Eve. Um, so a little little tidbit there. Uh, that's the easy one. Now for the difficult one. <laughs> Presidential apartments. It's five months later, still nothing's happening. 
it's still a problem. How can this get resolved? There's been promises been made, promises broken, promises made again, promises broken, nothing's happening. And it's just been dragging on. It is extremely unprofessional. Um, how this was handled, how it was um, mishandled, uh, it, it's just, I mean, I have, still have the same, same uh, flyer, says September 1st move-in date. Here we are five months later. Nobody's moved in. <laughs> uh, and there's only supposed to be six spaces. That's it. There's still nothing saying about a move-in date whatsoever. They got the, the, the market rate people out. The affordable housing rate people haven't gotten moved in. Still, September 1st was also, as everybody knows, in Amherst, that's pretty much where your lease expires and the new lease begins. So, been in limbo for five months. Um, Caymans, uh, they, they changed the rules on you. Basically, you're supposed to have the lottery, I'm sorry, application in, um, in by August 4th, and lottery date August 11th, September 1st move-in date, and one application. Then they seem to change the rules and say, Okay, no, nope. application August 4th, lottery date August 11th, and that's just to spend another time for a different, a, an additional application. And still no idea of why we're still waiting five months later, still doing the paperwork, just to get that off the ground. It's 21st century and we're still doing, still in the paperwork stage, instead of the move-in stage. And there's place, they have the units available, why aren't they getting people in? And you can't speak to Patrick Caymans because he's always on vacation. He's taking more vacation than the president of the country. He's on vacation all the time. There's no one to fill in for him when he's on vacation. And it's just extremely unprofessional. You can't get a hold of him. You're giving him a run around, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just wondering what can be done. I'm like thinking about going on a, on a medication slash hunger strike again because it, it's, it's just desperate times. What are you supposed to do? The, 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 the offer was made to like, well, we'll keep you in your place that you were at, we'll work with your la previous landlord, we'll, we'll pay for moving costs, we'll put you up in a different place until the room can, becomes available. There's nothing's been, nothing, no offer has come through. Period, and it's and it's a problem, and the reputation of the town is at stake. The reputation of Caymans, the 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 monopoly of Amherst, is at stake, and it's and it's driving everybody crazy. Uh, you hear people on the streets, and they're like thinking everything's all set, and it's not all set, you know. And so, what can <clears throat> what can be done to speed things? So along, this is criminal activity. Right, so thank you for the comment. Um, there are some things going on. I will at least offer that to you. Um, we may get some more update on that later tonight, but we also are, are regularly getting updates from uh, our building commissioner and, and the manager regarding, regarding the issue. Um, so I'll leave it at that for the moment, but um, hopefully we can potentially reach out to you after we know more and, and provide some more clarity on where where the situation lies at this point, but I'm hesitant to offer much more at this point as far as you know, we generally don't offer comments, so I'm gonna hold off on that. Um, I think there, there's many aspects of it that I don't know the details of, so I don't wanna offer that up, and I don't know that any of the board members want to either, but, but certainly um, uh, you know, we, can, we can, as a board, sort of check on that, and, and is a, it is an area of concern for us as well uh, as far as getting it resolved. Um, I, I agree with you, Mr. Slaughter. However, I might just um, say it might be helpful if, if um, the town identified its sort of point person on this issue. It's a complicated issue and has a lot of players, so that um, somebody uh, like Ms. Goldman, who's uh, waiting, has a place to go to get information um, that's not from the uh, property owner or the rental agent. Um, not necessarily to come here where we're not going to be able to give that information, but if we had um, an identified point person on this. And 
you have anyone off the top of your head right now, or do you need to? Oh, no, without talking to anybody, it'd be, be myself, or I would guess the building commissioner or um, senior planner. Uh, I'd have to think about who is the best, who's keeps most currently informed about it. Um, but initially, I would guess the town manager's office would be the easiest. So I'd say that so would be your. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of confused. Uh, so just to clarify, that sounds like a very good idea because it seems like a lot of entities have their hands in the pot, so to speak, and doesn't seem like, you know, it's like he said, she said kind of thing, back and forth, back and forth, and don't seem to be getting anywhere, and that nothing seems to be actually trickling down to the people that are actually involved. So do you, um, when the town manager, Mr. Bachman, says the town manager's office as a uh, point of contact for now, um, that's up on the next floor up on the mezzanine level mm -hmm. and so that gives you a place to go if you have a question because um, I know sometimes it's hard for us to reach you um, but for now I think that gives you a place to keep track of this issue well, that's how, that sounds wonderful but still again it's this is a very easily solvable issue but no one's it doesn't seem like it's moving at a very snail's well, pace. Uh, it, it you is don't moving. want to be moving, you know, all your right. stuff in, in the middle of winter. That's right. the worst time to move. Yep. Okay. And this was all so preventable, you know, and it just seems like it's been dragging on and dragging on and dragging Absolutely. on. Absolutely. And, and it's, it's Good just point. insane. And that, like I said, there needs to be a little a fire under someone's behind to right. get <laughs> uh, appreciate the concern. to expedite things because it is it's unnecessarily dragging on it's it's right. it's torture right. we, no, we, we, we fully appreciate the comments and 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 uh i would suggest you know reaching out to the town manager's office tomorrow and perhaps uh you know his office will be able to give you a synopsis of where that process is because i think they're keeping an eye on it and and would know the details of of how far it's moved or not moved or how soon the next steps will happen. Um, so I think that that's probably your best bet as far as your next next uh, place to go for information on on this. And and we, like you, are, are wanting this to be resolved sooner than later for a lot of reasons, and many of which you just stated. So I think at this point, we don't have any new stuff for you to t at, at this point, but but certainly reach out to the manager's office, and, and uh, they'll connect the dots. I, I appreciate that. I, I appreciate the concern, because that means a lot. Instead of being, it just feels like you're left hanging, you know, and that's what's extremely frustrating. Sure. The lack of communication. Well, thank it, you the, for more communication behind our, the closed yeah, doors and not communication. Thank you for keeping our attention on the issue. Yeah, yeah. that's what I wanted to do, just kind of give it an update that nothing's been happening. Yep. And also to see, um, I also have, uh, because other entities in, are involved, such as um, Representative Goldstein Rose offices also, knows about the issue, um, and, and in Congress, Representative McGovern is also being made aware of the issue as well, so because it has so much, many implications. Sure. And the, um, so that's why I wanted to bring it to, to your attention, but also just to see if, try to find some way to just figure out if there's got, there's got to be a better way. I don't want this to happen to anybody ever again. Right. And, it's it's just becoming really really extremely desperate just just trying to hold on to every day you don't know how you're supposed to mentally deal with it how to um deal with it in so such a way that you're not going to lose your mind it's like right. am i going to move today am i going to move tomorrow right it's 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 like you don't know and and so many things are contingent upon that and there's other deadlines doctor's appointments you can't right. get to yep. other trying to get to vote to, to register to vote because of right. the new address things you can't do because everything's been put off for so long and 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 you know you feel like you're being blamed yep. and it's a and it's become a legal issue as right. well no we're and has we're, that, that those implications and complications as well we're fully aware of that and so um we appreciate your comment and thank you for that and i think at this point there's not much else we can can get for you on that at the moment, but uh, and we do have some other things on our agenda we'd like to get to, but I appreciate yeah. you bringing it forward to us, so thank you. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so next up on our agenda, uh, I believe we'll go to action and discussion items to vote to change polling location precinct six. And so, uh, Mr. Bachman, do you want yes. um, to present to us? 
the uh, principal of the Fort R River School had requested that um, the town change the polling location from the music room, which is where it is currently, to the gymnasium. And this, the gymnasium is where the polling location is for other schools, so they felt like that would work better for them. And, and the town clerk has looked at it, the superintendent has looked at it. There's a letter in your uh, packet from the superintendent. Um, and it seems it actually would work, be a better location for voters as well. So we recommend that you, you and it's up to the select board to ch select and approve voting locations. So that's why it's before you tonight. Okay. Are there questions from the board for the manager regarding the, the change in polling location? Uh, it happens to be in, in uh, the polling location where I vote. <laughs> so I'm familiar with the building and, um, and uh, I do think the change would be beneficial, if nothing else, just for the space available. And I think it makes con access control a little bit better, even if, as the uh, person who came spoke earlier to us uh, uh, regarding safety concerns they have, I think it's still, uh, this will still make it better than it is now, so. Um, I'm happy to make that motion. Please it's do. Also, also my polling place, too. Right. Um, I move to approve a change in the designated polling location for precinct six from the Fort River Elementary School Music Room to the Fort River Elementary School Gymnasium in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 54, Section 24. Is there a second? Second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. Okay, just update. So, um, the, in, in a general sense, the superintendent has met with the uh, chief of police concerning um, uh, safety concerns that have been raised at the school committee level. And the chief of police, they met on, they met yesterday or last week, I forget exactly when, um, or not, wasn't me yesterday, um, maybe, I think it was today actually, and he has assigned a lieutenant to do a threat assessment on every polling location in a school. Uh, and come back with recommendations on them to um, to uh, the chief, to the superintendent, and what steps could be taken um, if there are th if there are concerns about safety for students and, and staff in the building. Ms. Brewer. If I could go ahead and follow up on that, then because I thought we talked about maybe under member reports, but since you so helpfully brought it up, um, you know we we get this concern every couple of years and. It's nothing new and it's not new to Chief Livingstone, it's not new to Superintendent Morris. And it's just always been determined that between parking and accessibility that those buildings are ideal buildings beyond the whole wonderful idea of democracy being visible to students and teachers at the same time. But obviously we are in a different reality than we were 20, 30 years ago. I really appreciate I wanted to just make sure I mentioned that to people because there's a real reason we use schools <laughs> because parking and accessibility are big issues. We get plenty of complaints about some of our other polling places where people, for example, oh, say where I vote in North Amherst where you have to, unless you have a handicap sticker, you need to park down a hill in order to get to the polling place. So um, it's only accessible to truly needing accessibility with to handicap spaces. So we, we struggle to find the right spaces, and so I appreciate all the work that's been put into figuring those out over the years. Um, as this is, I think, that idea of the threat assessment, I very much appreciate you bringing that up because that makes sense to me as like the next step for figuring this out because we haven't been able to really figure out how to get along with this. And I know that one of the concerns that's been raised is that if we have police in the schools associated with this, there's always been in Amherst a pushback against having a school resource officer in the elementary or middle or high school levels. And so taking this thoughtful approach of a threat assessment, and I think then obviously like security plans everywhere, one doesn't give out all those details then afterwards, but that that can continue to be shared with PTO, school councils, via the principals, et cetera so that people understand that it's not an easily solvable problem, even with trying to assign curriculum days. Every school system struggles with this. You see it across the state. I'm sure it came mm -hmm. up when you were on the school committee. Um, it can be really difficult to make all elections curriculum days because they're chosen for other reasons. So I appreciate the thoughtful approach, and if you could just keep us posted, I assume that there is time to 
not change polling places, but to you know, modify an approach or something if necessary prior to the March 27th election, given the timing we're in right now. Yes. So, so there's a lot of, um, you're trying to balance a lot of interests. So you like to be in the neighborhoods as close to the people where they're voting. You also, um, there's a lot of interest in if you consolidate voting locations, then you can have two polling places together and then that makes everything more efficient in a lot of ways. Um, having a, you know, curriculum days is, is a really good solution if, to, to handle that. One of the challenges is also finding constables to serve at all the polling locations. Um, you know, we talked about having police officers uh, at the polling locations. That gets to be uh, the concern you express, but also gets expensive because these officers are on detail, basically, at getting paid at the detail rate versus a, a constable rate. Um, but there, and there's there's um, it, it's just a, trying to find the balance that meets everybody's needs is a is a big challenge because um, there just aren't many locations that are handicap accessible in the neighborhood that you need the polling locations to be um, that people would recognize as a voting location. So that's why we have some of these oddball, or not oddball, locations that aren't as uh, conducive as a, as a public school. And, and just for a record, so when I was on the school committee in Somerville, we faced the exact same thing. Um, our situation was we were actually disrupting classes and moving people out of a classroom and moving stuff out. and. Um, became a regular issue because it was really disrupting classrooms as opposed to just losing a gym for a day. Um, so it's a, it's a, 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 we're not unique in dealing with this issue. Ms. Gruber. I'll just chime in briefly. Um, I like the threat assessment idea because if there's solutions that meet um, the, the concern as expressed tonight earlier in public comment and, and other parents' mm -hmm. concerns, if there's a way to um, mitigate the risk, then um, that it would be good to know, and yes, it is complicated, but I, I'd have to say I would put the um, safety of the children above all the other logistical complications and things um, that we do, and, but there, it doesn't necessarily mean curriculum day, doesn't necessarily mean moving location. Whatever the mitigations are for each building, as you explained in the threat assessment, but I, I do appreciate, I thought the issue has been brought to us in a very respectful manner, and it's something we'll work together with people to come up with acceptable solutions, but um, the times require us to think about it differently than we did, as Ms. Brewer said, yeah. you know, 10, 20 years ago, and, and it is the most important, the children's safety is the most important feature in all of this. And if we hit some of those other notes of visibility and, I mean, access is legal, that's I'm not that, but, you know, kids get to see us vote and that's all great. I mean, those are nice extras, but um, right. safety is the primary concern. So next on our agenda um, is the fiscal year 2019 water sewer rates announcement. I believe our intention here is to uh, surface the discussion. We have uh, a memo from Mr. Bachman and um, Mr. Mooring regarding water and sewer rates for the coming year. Um, so if you want to sure. walk us through that a little bit. Yes. So uh, in your packet is are two memos. One is to talk about the FY19 water and sewer rates. The proposal is to... Um, retain, uh, have, have no increase in the water rate, which is at 380 per 100 cubic feet, and to have a, a 15 cent increase um, in the sewer rate from 375 to 390, which is a 4% increase in the sewer rate. And the memo explains that, and uh, Mr. Mooring and Ms. Rusecki will be here at your next meeting when it's a more formal and conversational time to, for you to probe on, on what, where we are on the water and sewer sy um, system. Uh, in connection with that also, the board had asked us to examine the idea of an agricultural water rate, and there's a memo in your packet as well about consideration of an agricultural water rate, which would um, allow agricultural uses to not have to pay the sewer rate since a lot of their um, water is not going back into the sewer system. And the proposal um, is... Um, to create one of these things for bona fide agricultural uses um, 
and again, we could, it, it's, it seems to be, um, would have an impact on a very limited number of people who are farms that are using uh, water at this rate for uh, irrigation purposes. Um, also in your packet is a history of the um, water and sewer rates, so you can see where it has gone for the last long time, since 1977. And so I think a fuller discussion at your January 22nd meeting is what the plan is. Right. So given our memos, did anyone have any immediate questions for the manager relative to these topics? So on the 22nd then, are you expecting us to vote that same night? Typically you do, but uh, if you choose not to, that's up to you. But given that this is a different year, th the reason I asked that, I'm sorry, is because this is a different year because we do have this question about these. Uh, um, we don't normally argue a lot about our water and sewer rates. You tell us the amount, and we say, sure, that sounds good, and we <laughs> advertise the fact that it's so much better than our other neighboring communities. But this new piece with the agricultural, I guess my question then is since they're not here tonight to answer those questions because it's an unusual year that might have been a way to approach it but it's okay that they didn't and if we have any questions we'll just forward them to you sure. in hopes that the idea is still that any questions we have we can get answered before or that night so that we'll still be able to act that mm -hmm. night and we'll be on our normal schedule mm -hmm. right and that would be the the agricultural use piece would be a distinct motion from the water correct. rates, correct? Two actions. Yes. yes. Um, exactly. It's new. And has the um, Agricultural Commission had a chance to see the, the, the memo we got? They have not. And it's just, I would just want to be yep. able yeah. to have um, their input Good point. Yep. either ahead of time or if they're, they're certainly welcome to come to our meeting, but they don't need to if they could convey um, their thoughts. I, I'm really looking forward to getting that in place, we've talked about it for quite a while, and if we have something we can act on on the 22nd, that's great. And it's and time for the growing, you know, people could start yeah. doing the mechanisms right. for the next growing season. Right. I think uh, regarding the Ag Commission, they've not met in a little bit uh, various quorum issues that they've had, so I'm not sure if they're scheduled yet for January or not. I know they were looking for a date, but I'm not sure they, they found one, so. Okay. So given that, um, and that's why I already knew the answer to Ms. Cruz's question, because I knew they hadn't had a chance to meet, because I'd been hearing about their quorum issues, right. is if we could go ahead and just send it to them, yeah. it doesn't need to be on, I mean, right. they obviously can't deliberate via email, but that way they can ask questions back to you, mm -hmm. and, and, there's and tell us the AGCOM right. had this question, yep. but yep. they didn't actually get to talk about it at a meeting. One last follow-up on that, sure. uh, on outreach. Um, I think it was Jamie Wagner who came, and is she still on AgCom? Because we want to make sure she sees us. No, but we can make sure to reach out. Matter of fact, it's uh, it's Ronnie Wagner. Right. Yeah. It was, what? It was Ronnie. It's Ronnie Wagner. Who was yeah. here? Jamie used to be on oh, AgCom. Right. This is Ronnie. They're different. Right. But so, no, who came to speak to Ronnie us? Ronnie came to Ronnie, speak to Ronnie, us. Ronnie um, Wagner. Okay. So I was planning Sorry. on reaching out. Yeah. After this. After this. Okay. But before, but before right. the twenty second. As long as we <laughs> touch base with the people who've come right. a couple times to talk to us. Right. Make them aware of that. All right. I'm going to make a note of that right now. Are there any other questions off as we finish up on this region? Look forward to getting to act on that. So, next on our agenda is the MMA annual meeting resolutions, of which you had copies in your packet. And I, I tried to find something to dislike about them because that's usually what I do. But I really had a hard time on this, so I don't have any objections. From, unlike myself. Yeah, I I was uh, equally looking for something that would be a red flag for people of Amherst. I was you know, where we as a community would would have some struggle with it, but I don't think there was anything that I found either in that regard that would be. Uh, causing discomfort for our our, our constituents. Brewer? Yeah, there's sometimes, uh, well, there's always some sort of introduction in the actual booklet that we get when we get there, but it's probably you know still being printed as we speak for updates, et cetera, and that sometimes talks more about how they got to the point of doing that resolution, but. Um, 
excellent work by the commi committee members. It's basically all apple pie and kitchen sink <laughs> and all those metaphors of all the things we all say we all want. So and no red there, flags for there are no obvious mm -hmm. red flags. And so, and so there, it doesn't matter. It, I don't see a need for them to explain how they got from point A to point B, which sometimes surprises us when we get there and we read the thing and go, really? Because that doesn't make sense. And because that's happened associated with housing where right. we've had some disagreement on what the logic was that fed the resolution, not an issue for any of these that I can see, but Mr. Andy, Steinberg like, may have something. I didn't find anything that was in the resolution that concerned me. And uh, the flip side of what's not in the resolution is really harder to judge because I imagine that there are various discussions that take place as to what one community might want that would become controversial amongst other communities and then in the process they have to eliminate it certainly from our experience um, I would love to see something to urge um, that the uh, Commonwealth both administratively and legislatively look at the question of regional school assessment methodology and the um, various statutory provisions and regulatory provisions related to it, but um, that's the nature of something um, that might be reasons that someone suggested and not be there. Um, so it's sort of, when I looked at it, did I have any concerns about what's there? Absolutely not. So we need the yeah, there, there are other things, I, I agree, there are things that aren't there that <clears throat> I would also suggest we we as a community would be happy to offer, but nonetheless. I, I don't want to put Mr. Bachman on the spot, but <laughs> as they say, you know where I'm going with this. Um, so we have, Mr. Mooring is on a committee that deals with more, that deals with climate change and public works type issues and a variety of things. And Mr. Kravitz is on a committee that deals with economic development. I don't know what that falls under, but what Mr. Steinberg just said in terms of which committee would consider it, because there's obviously one that focuses more on schools, and I think it's one of the other ones. But I wonder if we could write them a, a note that says, you know, this next year will be awesome. if, Because how else are they going to find out that we're particularly interested in this? I mean, there are so few regional districts that, it, depending on who's sitting at the table, even though they do talk about transportation, for example, they may not be thinking much about assessment method. I think that there is a committee that deals with financial issues that brought that one forward. And of course, uh, and, um, until he passed away, Mr. Musanti was on that committee right. and he would have um, at least been able to convey back to us a discussion that might have occurred around that sort of an issue. Um, but uh, that is the, I mean, there's some, but we don't have anybody. I don't think on that committee now. No. But we could we could ask. We could write them a note that yeah. said this is what we mm -hmm. want for next time rather than just trying to remember to put it on our evaluation form when we're at annual meeting. Um, I think that would be. Yeah, I, th I think what's a really important thing is to talk to staff members like John Robertson, the legislative director, about this issue. So the more people who speak to him about it, the, it starts to ring a bell for him like, oh, we do have to pay attention to it. And he would get it right away. You could speak. It doesn't take a lot of expl explaining to him to, for him to get what the issue is. And I'll do the same. Okay. So, uh, shall I go ahead and make motions? I have, I have one other MMA okay. conference thing to say, but why don't we do the motions first? And do it some other time. Okay. So go um, right ahead. I move that the select board take a position in favor of the proposed resolution ensuring a strong and enduring fiscal partnership between cities and towns and state government in fiscal 2019 and beyond. Um, at this, I don't know why it has 2018 in parens. That was the one <laughs> mystery. <laughs> the one mystery, but I'll include that um, at the Saturday, January 2018. MMA annual business meeting. Is there a second? Second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 
move that the select board take a position in favor um, of the proposed resolution to the ballot question that would reduce sales and use tax rate 2018 at the Saturday, January 20, 2018 MMA annual business meeting. Second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, and I move that the select board take a position in favor of the proposed resolution supporting a local, state, federal partnership to combat the effects of climate change 2018 at the Saturday, January 20, 2018 MMA annual business meeting. Second. There's a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And that takes care of those. And um, I guess the only other thing I'd say, Mr. Slaughter, is that um, we probably should get clarification as to what actions we can appropriately legally take um, on taking positions on ballot questions in advising the community if it's appropriate about the effect of ballot questions when it's closer to the election um, in November of this year. You mean re relative to um, November ballot questions? November mm -hmm. referendum yes. questions, correct? Correct. State. State. I, I said, yeah. since I was doing a reference yeah. to what we just did, I was assuming that that was well, understood. Because we just want to be clear. <laughs> yeah. We know there's another one out there. We discussed at the last meeting, I believe. Mm -hmm. You know, to that effect. Uh, would this be an appropriate time to bring up an, uh, another MMA thing, or do you nope, wait I think it's as good, good a time as any. Okay, so <laughs> just um, maybe you already noticed this. I noticed today because I was um, looking at the program online that um, for the select uh, men's meeting at the annual meeting, um, Jay Ash and Crystal, Cor Crystal Cornegay are going to be there. So it's going to have a focus on housing and other related issues, and I just wanted to uh, I was thinking it would be great if as many of us could go to that meeting while we're at the conference um, and weigh in on um, our own housing issues and our issues around Ma Mass Works grant funding and use that as an opportunity. And I think if we have sort of strength in numbers, um, that would be great. And I, I believe they're going to be trying to roll out the governor's housing choice initiative, but it's. Um, a good face-to-face -face time with uh, the Secretary of Housing and Economic Development and the uh, Undersecretary for Housing. So just maybe everyone already knew that, but I just want to make a plug for us going on force. So are you basically saying that sometimes because some of us miss the business meeting because it's boring, we shouldn't miss it this year? <laughs> because it's gotten so much better over the last couple of years. They keep trying new things. Also, you know? it's, it's Pretty early, isn't it? It is. It's, it's at eight thirty. It may be more early than boring. Is the issue? <laughs> yes, but eight thirty makes it tough. Us Although they do feed to us. really rev up and I think sort of a strength in numbers and. Uh, but to make our presence felt rather than to just attend is what you're saying. Just saying. Well, I appreciate you. I haven't had that. a chance to look closely at the at the schedule, so I'm. I appreciate you mentioning it to us because that is certainly going to be. Uh, a topic um, it's certainly a topic of interest amongst the municipal housing trust so yeah. so it's uh, um, having information from that will be useful to to the, the members of the trust um, any other MMA related topics we want to bring up at the moment if not then I will move on to section 6 of our agenda which has resolutions and proclamations and again the purpose of this it shows the uh, center on 300 anniversary in the Grand B 250th anniversary. Both of the communities have reached out to us to see whether we want to be in their parade. I think we're a little behind if we were going to be in the Sunderland parade. Um, and I don't know that we need to take any action this evening. Mostly uh, there were a couple things in our packets where they had given us the sort of particulars on how you participate in that. But I didn't know if s separate from being in the parade whether or not we wanted to um, send some of a letter of congratulations or some you know proclamation of congratulations to them at some point 
And again, we can think about it. I just wanted to surface it because we've gotten a couple of these. Um, and so I didn't know if anyone had any comment or. Uh, I guess that uh, I would be inclined to suggest that somebody um, ask Mr. Roberts or another person who is involved with our 250th as to whether either of these communities participated in um, our celebration because I think that that might um, uh, be something we'd want to consider. And um, also we'd need to be thinking about what we would do and um, there's other reasons to contact Mr. Roberts therefore because he might be able to um, provide something that's unique to Amherst that could also contribute to a parade um, in the way of his uh, farm so um, and his horses. So if uh, that would be my suggestion is we just um, ask him both in his role from the um, organizing our parade in the 250th and that question that I asked and then the other if appropriate. Um, I read the invites and I think it was Sunderland it was like hey we wrote to you before we haven't heard from you I mean they re they're lining up their um, people and um, I, it just made me think we could say yes but then who you know like who would we bring I mean you know a couple of select board members walking down the street is pretty boring um, you know if it's the horses or kids or a club you know something that a band if, if we could I don't know how we do this because we don't usually do it this way. if we could think of who who would go to represent us that there's in uh, Mr. Steinberg I appreciated your idea about talking to Mr. Roberts but it sounded a little bit like well if I got a holiday card from them then maybe I'll send them <laughs> <one."> <laughs> <laughs> so I think we should do it but I don't know how we do it well, yep. they're on different weekends in June, so we have a little bit of time, <laughs> well, even if they are pressing us to get in line. Well, I right. think one of the things with Central is they're ordering things, and I think, you know, if you want a good spot in the parade, the earlier you well, get your application, the better. we should say yes, pe but pending. <laughs> so if we're going to be that specific, then I want to know if a good spot means that the people with the sirens are directly behind you because in my experience that is not a good spot to be on to, you know, to be in the parade because but you want to be in front of the horses definitely <laughs> it's like we, we will participate pending notification of placement <laughs> but i do think we should participate i think we should tell them I think that I should not do this. I think that our chair <laughs> should tell them, with perhaps Ms. Pepple's help, that we would like to participate. I think that we should then copy Mr. Roberts at his usual email address saying, we would like to participate, but we need your help to do this because otherwise we're just gonna be little sad looking select board members carrying a banner that says Town of Amherst. So please help us. Um, and he, then we could also ask him the question about Granby and Sunderland on our rainy 250th parade because although I was in it I because I was in it I obviously didn't see all the units so I'm not exactly th sure thinking about who might join in on this but I do I do think it's important that um, we get it in right away because it was really upsetting to the 250th committee when people would not answer the question sure. and so they do need to feel like they have the lineup this is yeah. not like the UMass homecoming parade where you know it just kind of works it just kind of shows up and right. you know who shows up who shows up they, oh, it's, uh, it's a bit more like a wedding reception exactly. when people don't RSVP it's a little it. tougher to plan so exactly. I understand. so you, you would like us to say yes we will participate we just don't know how yet That's yes basically what we're saying yes so we would have to tell them we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. We don't. We will either have people walking, or we will have Barry Roberts saving us because or, we don't or know some yet. Somebody else. Motorized or vehicle. Flag around my neck. The awesome. business improvement yeah. district. Yeah. It's possible the business improvement district or the chamber, because it's the Amherst right. area chamber, um, may be participating as well, and so there may be some synergy there, just as there has been with it UMass. It could be other vehicles. It could be antique things. It could be. You want to ride in that convertible? I hear you. <laughs> I just want to be practicing my wave, <laughs> Your wave, my queenly wave. So we'll, we'll reach out to both communities and let them know we'll we'll participate in some manner. We just don't know what yet. Okay. So yeah. we'll, do, we'll do that. And then you'll also reach out to Mr. Roberts. Yes. Well, luckily, yep. because he has the whole bid affiliation then as well. <laughs> right. He can be all those exactly. things for yes. us. We'll wear many hats. All right. So um, 
Next on our agenda is uh, licenses, public way, and metered parking reservations is the section, but we have a consent calendar with a number of items, one of which we've already pulled out and, and uh, taken action on. And so uh, we could take action on the remaining items unless someone wants to pull one of those out for a particular reason. But this is the point where um, if we could just have about one or two minutes to actually read the motion to sheet. actually read them <laughs> absolutely uh, that was uh, that I was referring to absolutely so we'll take a, um, a moment or two to read through these and then we'll uh, reconvene in a minute once we've done our bit of speed reading Close to ready? All right. So if there's, so we have consent calendar, which we pulled item four out. We didn't formally do that, but we informally pulled it out and took the motion. So it would be a, an, a, a consent calendar uh, as amended. If someone would like to make that motion or if they would prefer to pull out particular items for movement. Yeah, I, 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 actually, if I could ask Mr. Bachman one question about the request for, um, the Winterfest, and then uh, it may be no reason to pull it out. Uh, and that is, I was a little bit confused by the wording of uh, it being labeled as for the uh, finale event, but starting at 1 p.m., because that really covers 
in the finale, is it the fireworks or is it the entire final day? And I just as clarification more than anything else. It's a little different this year, and I wasn't sure what we had done in prior years. I th I don't know the answer to it off the top of my head. I think it's the entire day because they announced that the it's a day long celebration that happens on Saturday, February tenth. It's called the if I may. Mm -hmm based on past experience, which of course is not always compelling, but based on past experience, they do serve wine and alcohol, wine and beer all afternoon, basically. And I believe the reason they're calling it grand finale event is because of the week yes. Yes, the of week. events. So rather than just thinking of the fireworks as the grand finale, like people often do, it's the grand finale to an entire week of activity. I do think it would be better to amend the motion, however, to not say anything about an extension that's just that a, bad, a good way of phrasing things unless there's a legal reason for that that says that says it's the hours of one to seven with um, a snow day of Sunday the 11th instead it won't because it won't be extended we're not we're not extending the approval we're not gonna let them sell alcohol when they're closed it, I mean it's, yeah it's not 20 I appreciate the attempt alcohol, but so I yeah, think that we just need to be clear or we tend to like to put everything in one sentence and we just maybe could break it up a little differently so why don't Mr. we Steinberg's um, good at that why don't we pluck that piece out and make that motion independent okay. of, of the others uh, perhaps would be best So I move to approve the items listed on the consent calendar for the January 8, 2018 agenda as amended to remove Amherst Cinema, which we already did, and the uh, Cherry Hill license. Second. There's a motion and a second. Is there further discussion on that part of the consent calendar? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? So that's unanimous. And so does someone have newly crafted motion language for the uh, your fest? I think what we would mean is with an alternative date of Sunday, February 11, 2018, in the case of inclement weather. But I would, to make it um, read more smoothly, I think that I would change it a little bit more. Yeah. And that is, um, so it would say um, on Saturday, February 10th, 2018, from the hours of 1 p.m. to 7 p.m. with an alternative date of Sunday, February 11th, 2018 in the case of inclement weather. Nicely done. Second. Okay. Did you get those mm -hmm. rearrangements? Mm -hmm. You did. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? So that's unanimous as well. And I like the idea that it's a week-long celebration. You had the card mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to give a little sure. promo for it while we're here? I know it's a month away, but. So it's eight days and seven nights filled with family-friendly fun and merriment. Um, this is the card that's going out to everybody. Um, and it's, they are very ambitious this year. I think they're, they're very energized about doing this. They've, they've worked with the bid and with the uh, Chamber of Commerce they want to have a lot of music downtown, so it's going to be something every night during the week, uh, culminating with the traditional um, Winterfest Day at Cherry Hill. So they're pretty excited about it, and they've got, um, they're going to have things at Amherst Cinema, Jones Library, the Hitchcock Center, Eric Carle Museum, the Mullen Center, uh, downtown restaurants. They have a lot of events um, to be done inside at the Mullen Center, uh, especially good things for kids. So they're, they're really excited at LSSC for, and really give them um, commend them for taking on and making this a bigger event. It's great to hear. Yes. Friends of Amherst Recreation is something we don't hear about very often, but they do, as I understand it, a substantial amount of work to make this event mm -hmm. happen. And so we appreciate, we want to make sure that we do appreciate them, even though they're not our usual sort of town appointed mm -hmm. committee. They're in addition to the commission. They work very hard on this particular event in addition to some others. 
and we can all go to these and that's show right. our support. Oh, that's right. We encourage the community to go to them as well. <laughs> um, so next up, we have uh, a couple of things left. We have uh, the town manager report, select board member reports. We also have uh, a few sets of minutes, and I didn't know if we wanted to take care of the minutes now. If just to sort of dispense with them so that we could have a more expansive conversation about the manager report, or if we wanted to wait. I'm open to either or. We could go ahead and do the minutes, which I'm gonna abstain from, and I'll just call, turn it into a recess then. <laughs> So I, I will just say that uh, in looking through the minutes, I didn't see uh, anything that sort of leapt out at me regarding them that I was concerned about. But Mr. Steinberg, did you want to give a little introduction because you look, tend to look at these? I did. I did look at all of the minutes and uh, made uh, the only very minor. Um, suggestions and uh, because I was absent from one of the meetings I'm gonna uh, if we're gonna have a problem if I don't you can, you can, go, you can abstain I can abstain yeah, and it would be still passed. Uh, the majority of those present will be okay because while well, we I have okay. four of us here we'll we're pausing for a moment uh, in, we in have the, a quorum of three and I Maybe I've got, I believe majority. from so majority the majority of the quorum. Mm -hmm. So two vote yes and one abstains and passes. Okay. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Great. That's fine. Okay. Or um, the opposite. I was not <laughs> here on the, I was not here for the meeting on the 21st. August 21st. And um, so I read the minutes for the um, form, but not for the content. And uh, I did alert Ms. Kruger that I needed somebody who had been at the meeting to read it for content also. and. Um, uh, and I did, I did do so. Thank you. I also read through those and didn't find, since I was there, <laughs> I found them so to be okay. So I would quickly uh, just uh, make a motion on four of them. I move mm -hmm. to approve the minutes for August 17, September 11, December 9, and December 11, 2017. Second. As presented. Oops. Second. All right, so we have a motion and a second for the discussion. <coughs> Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 So that's unanimous among the three of us, so it's one absent and one abstaining. And I can make the motion on the, if you want, for the uh, meeting that Mr. Stenberg wasn't able to attend. So, um, I just had my, I just had my motion um, to, I move to approve the minutes of August 21st, 2017, um, as written. Second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. Oops. Nope. <laughs> nope. Nope. I've done uh, yeah, no. <laughs> two abstention <hours>. and <laughs> two abstaining. So it's uh, right. Two abstaining. Right. I think that still works. I think technically you can vote for minutes that you weren't <coughs> at, but yeah, makes us uncomfortable like generally. That. We did it and it's kosher. All right. Do we need a short recess for a moment? Just because I think we're about to come to the manager's report and <laughs> we've lost someone, so yeah. perhaps a short recess and Well, you wanna have a short recess? Why don't we do a real short recess and then that'll give you a moment to prepare and we'll get all the membership back for that. So we're all back, so I think we'll rejoin our meeting. And at this point, uh, Mr. Bachman, if you'd like to take us through your report, please. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the topic of the day is weather. Everybody's <laughs> suffered through this very bitter cold spell, and um, the town has um, experienced issues just like a lot of people have at home. Uh, we've had building issues uh, through with multiple buildings, um, and you know the snow removal operations we couldn't do that as quickly as we wanted to because it was just too bitterly cold so they they did the snow removal last night when it wasn't as cold so downtown looks a lot better today um, there um, but so first I want to commend all of our public safety people the DPW the police and fire who've been out 
uh, 24 hours a day, literally for all three departments, they've been out 24 hours a day addressing um, anybody's needs. Uh, additional staff were added for the fire and for police in anticipation of some uh, additional calls that may have been needed. Um, DPW is out uh, even when it wasn't snowing to address snow drifts and things like that because that kept popping up throughout the night. Um, so uh, commendations to all those folks for really stepping up. A number of calls of uh, regular residents noticing water pouring out of houses. The, the people who houses for sale, people who are away, um, just didn't anticipate how absolutely frigid cold this was. Um, again, DPW was able to respond. Fire, fire or police usually was the were the first to respond, and then they would call in the DPW, who would try to turn off the water at the street just to prevent any more damage that was already happening. Uh, this happened multiple times, unfortunately, for those fa for those families who own the houses. Um, in this building, we had a number of issues. Uh, the um, heating unit in the bottom vestibule failed, um, and trying to maintain that overnight trying it, it's a the vestibule which is the handicap access to the building has to be maintained open but trying to insulate it as best we can um, there's a fire extinguisher um, head right there so we can't let that get um, cold um, lots of space heaters and nervous about leaving the space heater so people are coming in at all hours to double check um, the building just to see what's going on on Sunday around 10 a.m., there's a general power outage throughout the downtown area. About 350 customers were affected um, and, and included the central fire station. Many of the businesses included town hall um, and Eversource you know, said they would have it back up by 3.30. <coughs> what happened at town hall is our generator kicked in, but then it um, shut itself down after a period of time. Um, and there was a lot of concern about what had happened with that. We had, a, uh, we had our the assistant town manager was here. I was here. Our new facilities director was here. We had um, two people, you know, three people from um, our facilities department. Um, Mary, who does the clean, she she was probably the hero. She was happy. She was worried about the building. She was happened to be driving through and saw smoke coming out of the generator, and Jeez. so and the, and there were a lot of people who were going to church. They're saying like, what's going on here? Um, and uh, and then we also brought over. We had two um, people from the wastewater treatment plant who are very mechanical, and so they were able to come over and help diagnose. All hands on deck. Everybody's and the fire department was here, obviously, when they saw a fire. Um, they, they didn't see fire, they saw smoke. Um, we were working on all kinds of contingencies. Uh, the fire chief had, had established contingencies in case um, electricity did not get turned on in time for Ann Whalen and Clark House because those buildings were did not have heat at the time. Uh, he had arranged for there to be buses and for there to be a shelter available if we needed it on just a you know, very short notice with UMass, um, sort of activated all the existing lines. So people were very active yesterday and it worked out. Fortunately, we didn't have to utilize any of those things. Um, we, were, we had arranged for a generator to be brought here for this building. This building is critical to the infrastructure of the town because our internet and for the, the entire town internet, including the police and fire department, operates out of this building and the, and the, and the police station. Fortunately, the police station wasn't impacted. Um, I think the high school was. Um, so, but the good news was it happened during the middle of the day when it was a little bit warmer um, and it got resolved, uh, Eversource resolved everybody by, by 3.30, which is when they said they would. And the town hall was turned on by about 12.30. So all those sort of contingencies um, did not have to uh, come into play. The, um, so credit to all the people who turned out um, and helped with this situation. The um, two, two impacts of that, one is that uh, when the power did go back on, everything was fine except for one major component of, of the heating system for this building, which they were able to figure out how to keep it operating, but it needs some attention. Uh, there was a contractor in there today. Um, the um, generator, uh, to, to the very, the, how cold it was, had, there were some pieces that had frozen inside it, so when the generator kicked on, when the power went down, um, it started 
heating, overheating. I'm do, using my language. This is not exactly what happened, but <laughs> it's, it seemed to like it overheated and then it shut itself down and it's, it started like saying, wait a minute, something's wrong here because some pieces were frozen in the exhaust or something like that. So something bad happened. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that uh, we had the um, um, contractor out today and while it's a, it's a very young generator and only has 37 hours worth of work on it, it cost us $100,000, I think, to install. Uh, there's no permanent damage. It should be operational now. So having them look at it and service it today. It was serviced in November, so it had been paid attention to. It's just one of those things that when this you get this bitterly cold, those things happen. Um, so that's, and this is just this building. Um, it's happened in a lot of other buildings as well. So just kudos to all the people who've been out there. Uh, equipment takes a beating in this one, and especially our DPW equipment. And they, you know, it's a lot of it stored outside. So getting it started is always a challenge. Um, and those those people uh, were out in all hours um, during the blizzard and other times. So just thank you to all of them. Well, we were all home saying we're not leaving the house. They're out there um, being called in. And especially on um, Christmas Day, they had to be called in um, early in the morning to address the storm, the Christmas morning storm. And, um, you know, nobody missed. They all gave up their Christmas morning, which is probably the most treasured day for a lot of people. Um, so just they, they um, are really do a great um, uh, thanks from all of us. The other thing that happened was that while they were out plowing on Christmas Day, a lot of people from the neighborhoods came out and offered them treats, saying thank you for doing this. So it was, it was kind of cool because they would go back, and, or people would come down to the DPW in this horrible storm and drop food off for them. So it was really a sort of a nice sort of reciprocity for, for the people who appreciated that. And I think people in town really did appreciate the work that they were doing. So fantastic work there. Um, the a couple other outreach things. The the next cup of Joe is going to happen on Friday, Friday, um, January. Uh, got the wrong date on it. January twelfth. Yeah. Bottom of that. Yeah. Oh, that was last time. At the at Atkins, and I'll have Sonia Aldrich. That'll be the day after we release the budget. So if people have questions about the budget or anything in general, that Atkins is usually a nice place to go. There's plenty of parking, um, and people are that's always been a good venue for us. Uh, I continue my um, meetups with employees, which is a fun thing to do for me, and I appreciate the, what I learned from the people. Um, a little meetup, hello, my name is Amherst type thing that we share with people. Um, those things are always educational to me. This is where we bring um, um, six or five people from different departments, and they tell me they, they have different lengths of tenure for the town. We talk about what makes, why they came to the town, how I can help them do their job better, um, what they, just in general, what they think can make the town better. So it's a really nice thing, um, both ways, I think. Um, the, we had a uh, meeting with the chancellor at UMass uh, in December, uh, along with the assistant town manager and the economic development director, and um, had a nice frank exchange with the needs of the town and the goals of the university, and we'll talk a little bit more about that at some point when we talk goals and things like that. Um, the winter parking um, system, we have uh, triggered that twice now, and both times it was to um, be prepared to clean up. So the last time was Sunday night, so we would, were, cars were removed from the street, um, in, tr in order to be able to clean up the downtown area and uh, keep car uh, cars off the street as plowing. Most people aren't parking on the street during plowing, so it's not, a, people are, are sort of used to having no parking ever, so this allows people to park. We think that most of that parking is gonna be happening downtown, so when we do call a snow emergency, there's a protocol that's been established where it gets put on the website, it gets goes through uh, social media. Um, for Sunday night, if you were watching the football game, it was, it was going through uh, the the TV as, as having a parking ban that night. Um, yes, um, we send out individual, we send out emails to anybody who has a parking permit, so they get an, an email saying parking ban's on, and, we send a, a, and then we sort of retract all those things once we call the parking ban off. So all those things are again done, just in op reverse order. Uh, the next thing we're going to be doing is 
on the week of January 2nd, 22nd, we're going to be reaching out to the university and to um, the university has offered us multiple venues to be able to communicate with students, especially students who live in off-campus housing because that's where a lot of times people don't understand what the rules are. They, we want to educate them about how they can be notified. Um, and so we don't want to tow cars, basically, as we want them off the streets when it, when it comes time. Um, the last two uh, incidents, we've had to tow five cars one time and six cars the second time. So it's, there's not this massive towing thing. And I think that that's sometimes people who've just gone away or just you know, left their car there have received no complaints. People understand that uh, they've, at least they haven't complained. Maybe they don't understand, but they haven't complained uh, as far as we know. Um, so I think the system is working. Um, the the um, And uh, we have four lights up now, um, lights in the center of town, one at University Drive and Amity Street, one at um, College and South Pleasant Street, and one at East Hadley Road. Um, once the weather breaks, they'll be able to get more out. But it's really, we tried to concentrate on the downtown area because that's where the bulk of it is uh, in terms of where we need the cars off the roads because that's where we really do the snow removal. And there hasn't been much other, you know, pe you know plow, plow drivers have not been complaining that cars are parked on the road and they can't do the plowing that they usually do. So that's worked out really well. And, um, you know, we've got a nice system in place that the DPW triggers it. They notify dispatch. No, dispatch notifies lots of different people, the police and the fire, everybody. So it, it's a pretty good system. Um, so um, the uh, previously I had reported to you, and just for the public, there is a written report in the board packet, so it's all written down. Um, this, that happens on the first meeting of every month. Uh, the, the boiler at the North Amherst Fire Station was replaced, and thanks to the school, um, um, some, of the, some people at the school, facilities people, for helping to do that. Um, we also had to use emergency procurement procedures, and that was very helpful because there's a lot of things you have to do to be able to buy something very quickly, which we, this was an emergency, clearly an emergency. Uh, but you still have to notify the state. You still have to publish it in the central register, things like that. Our procurement officer was very good at that. And um, you know, the, the, when the state called me up to can verify some of the information, they said, you deserve an A-plus for the work that you did, uh, which I was really pleased to hear. The, um, and I talked to the fire chief today. The boiler, you know, the new systems are very small. We had to cut up the last one to get it out of the room because things had been put into the boiler room since then. And the new one is tiny. <laughs> it's, a, it's dual boilers. They turn on and off. They, they're very efficient. It's a good thing. And the interesting thing about that is that it was scheduled, according on our facilities plan, to be replaced in two years. So it just didn't quite make it to the life we thought it could have had. But that's pretty good at, at, at estimating. Um, one of the things that we've been working on pretty diligently is we've talked about the deep dive we're doing with our information technology department. And that group has really come together and what has been, was a challenge for them is that they had so many projects on their plate and trying to decide what is important, responding to people who are, who are saying, we need you to do this, we need you to do that. And I was as guilty as anybody else of saying, this is really important, do this. And I think uh, we've really put a lot of effort into planning for them to try and identify the um, top projects. Um, they have. 85 projects that are on their list of things to do um, in the next three years, basically. Um, and they range very large projects to small projects. And, um, but they've prioritized them. They put a name to them. We've met with it, all the department heads and um, everybody sort of and said, look at where we have, how we've prioritized your project. If you like it, you know, if you think there should be a different priority. Um, there's just, everybody wants everything done right away. It just can't be done. I mean, there's things that I want done right away. Just, we've tried to prioritize <laughs> things that could be accomplished quickly. We're, um, and some things are just gonna take a long time. So, and we have some really good experience down there. For instance, a permit tracking system for the um, community, for the building department and for all that whole, that whole department. Um, we know that that's gonna take a year of implementation to do, to do it right. And, um, but we can get started on it. And so we have now have milestones set up and 
So a lot of credit to the IT department for taking that on themselves. Um, the, um, the fire department, we continue to monitor their payroll because they've been experiencing a lot of, uh, they have some long-term leaves, they have some, um, a lot of illness right now for some reason. I think a lot of people have been sick. Um, and uh, so they're, they're trying to fill in as much as they can. So working with that. Speaking of the fire department, um, Hadley, as you all know, had issued an RFP for ambulance services. Uh, the town of Amherst did not respond to that RFP because there were certain conditions that we could not meet. For instance, one of the conditions was that you had to have an ambulance located in the town of Hadley, and we were not going to place one of our ambulances in the town of Hadley 24 hours a day. Um, the, um, the town of Hadley has then reached out to us and asked us to meet with their ambulance study committee, which we will do at the end of this month, uh, to talk to them about um, why we didn't respond, what we think were the challenges. Uh, the interesting thing was that they did have one uh, valid response, uh, but with a, a charge that's substantially higher than we have been charging the town of Hadley. So in a way, the market has spoken as to what the value of the service is, and I think that will we'll inform us as we go about talking to Hadley about the kinds of services that we're able to deliver. And also, it's an opportunity for them to tell us if there are things that we're not doing for them that they would like us to do. A um, lot of different things happening there in the town of Hadley and for the town of Amherst. So that's a multi-variable sort of conversation that we'll be having over the course of the next few months. Um, the chair and I met with the PV Pioneer Valley Transit Authority Executive Director a few weeks ago now, and um, basically I think what we came out with that is that the route changes for the B43 don't seem to be a very high priority and we're not going to be uh, mobilizing all kinds of people to protest it because the route changes were really uh, generated by the Department of Tran the Mass Department of Transportation, MassDOT not by PVTA, and PVTA hadn't really taken their steps, and the chair might comment on that um, uh, later. Um, really pleased that we've received a LAND, L-A-N-D, grant from the Executive Office of Energy and Envi Environmental Affairs for the Epstein Pond Project for $270,000, and now we'll be requesting matching funds, which we're required to do through CPAC uh, and town meeting. Um, we talked about Winterfest, which is um, uh, uh, the week-long uh, uh, activities. It's going to be really exciting this year. The town of Pelham has reached out to uh, the treasurer collector and to us to see if we would be willing to take on their tax collection services. Um, and I think that's just an exploratory conversation. We, we do their assessing services now. They have a treasurer collector who's retiring. They're advertising for a treasurer collector. Um, but it's something I think they want to see what, what it would take for us to take on that service. There aren't that many parcels. We have professional staff ready to do it. It would require one of our staff to be in Pelham for a day a month, a day a week, um, which is how we do it with, for the assessing office. Um, and so it's something that we are considering because if it's something that we can do within our existing staffing capacity, we'd like to take it on and as a, both as a service to Pelham but also um, as a way to generate some funds for the town. Um, the big projects that we have coming up this uh, spring, North Common Restoration and Groff Park, are both moving forward uh, with design. They are, um, interestingly, because it's horizontal design, the, the bidding process for hiring designers is much easier, and so we're moving forward on both of those projects uh, expeditiously uh, because we really want to make sure that if we can get it done in the spring, in this this summer we'd like to get it done this summer both of them um, for the north common process the project there are a lot of um, committees and boards that are involved with it because a lot of it's a it's the most important site in town practically and everybody's going to have a care about what it looks like so the public participation process will have to be pretty um, and, uh, robust and so that might not get started this this spring but we'll see how we, far we get um, the, uh, I think we already announced that we re the uh, Beacon Communities uh, had received its incentive tax credits, which was really important to that project, and that project is now able to move forward 
Um, there's activity already. They've been in uh, talking to the building department about what they need to do to get their permits ready to go. I know um, there's some site activity happening up, uh, up there already as they are preparing to look at the barn that they ha will have to relocate or raise and um, empty that out. So there's lots of things happening on that. Um, Craig's Doors uh, has received its funding from the governor. The governor has, re has released the funds. I think that this, this especially cold weather really brought to the fore the challenges that a lot of people face when the weather's so cold. And I think he just, um, it, it became clear that our funding and a lot of other f funding for sort of things like for homeless shelters throughout the state were just a ridiculous thing to be held hostage over some budget issues that the governor had. So they're very happy to to have addressed that. Um, the town engaged in the downtown planning activity, which um, I'm not sure if you wanted to have a follow-up conversation about that. We've talked a little bit about it. Um, there is, there's a small group that's been working on planning this. There are, we've identified that we need to reach out in multiple ways to people to hear from them. Um, in terms of not just continuing to do the same kind of activity that draws the same people, but to try and broaden the people who could participate in what the downtown area should look like. Um, for the dog park, uh, Dave Zomack's been very active in trying to identify a site. For dog parks, uh, for dog park, uh, the, the dog park committee is, are, is very anxious to move forward on that and especially trying to get something ready for this town meeting, which is the goal. Um, I'm hoping that we don't have to take land off of the tax roll to make this happen. We're looking at uh, town-owned sites wherever we can, uh, but you'd be surprised how difficult it is to find an, a suitable town-owned site that's the right size and has all the amenities that you'd like. That's in a location that would be agreeable to most people. So uh, it's, a, it's a puzzle, but uh, Dave Zomack is really good at these things. Um, the firefighter study, Staff, the fire staffing study, which we that has concluded, um, we are getting started with a, a small targeted group, which includes our co-finance directors and um, the chief and assistant chief, and we'll be meet, meeting regularly in a smaller group to say to really get into the conversation about the fire department and how it delivers its services, what kind of staffing. Uh, is really needed, what kind of services that we're providing. Uh, everything, you know, as I've said from day one, everything's on the table. Um, this will be informed somewhat by what happens with the town of Hadley. If they choose to ch take up their, uh, the, their, their vendor um, to provide their ambulance services, uh, that will impact how, uh, um, how we look at fire staffing as well. 20% uh, of our calls, our medical calls, go to the town of Hadley out of 5,000 calls we do annually, 1,000 of them roughly. Um, go to Hadley, so that that's a big uh, impact on our uh, department. Um, the North Amherst Library, as you recall, the um, town meeting appropriate funds for uh, design services, and so we've sent out the RFQ. There is an information meeting set up for I think two weeks for people who are interested in bidding on that, and we've, we're on schedule for when people need to submit their um, our, their responses to that. Um, the health insurance, the biggest issue that I've been working on probably is the health insurance for the town. That's a, uh, you will hear a whole lot more about this on um, Thursday when we talk about the budget because it's really driving everything for the FY18 budget and for the FY19 budget. Um, our health insurance trust has uh, had a balance and has been uh, deteriorating primarily because a large number of large claims. We have reinsurance for any claim that goes over $250,000, but um, at, you get a few of those and suddenly it's, you're, you're, talking, we, you're talking like a million dollars or, or $250,000 that we have to pay first. And then the clock starts ticking every July 1 because those, those policies expire. And so that we start picking up dollar one. Um, very robust discussions with our insurance advisory committee. It's a very, um, well-informed group. We had um, a meeting in December in which we were hoping that they would approve another increase, which this would be the third increase in insurance rates. Um, it would be $200 per family, $100 for individual, of which the town pays either 75 or 80% of it. So 
we feel like this third increase would stabilize the trust for FY18 and probably for FY19, but no guarantees about that. Uh, the Insurance Advisory Committee met last week. Uh, we had another meeting scheduled for Wednesday of this week, but at their meeting on the third, they voted unanimously 14 to zero to support the increase from of $200 and $100 for the for the plans, and this is, would be applied to our retirees, for employees at the Amherst Regional School District, for employees of the Town of Pelham, employees of the Town of Amherst, and the Amherst Public Schools, obviously. Um, <clears throat> there are about a thousand members in the in the trust, and um, so it's a big pool of people that were responsible for providing health insurance. And I am the trust administrator, and I can't let the pool um, fail. And so that's why we needed money to sustain the pool. The pool is just that. It's money that we all put in, the towns and the school districts uh, and the employees, and then we pay our claims out of this pool. We don't buy insurance policies. We are self-insured. Um, and so I think the employees have learned that it's us that are using this service, this, these, these medical bills, and we're paying them out. Uh, we contract with Harvard Pilgrim and with Blue Cross to provide the service. Um, with this, again, the same approach, we, we have a smaller group that has been assembled, which includes um, four experienced people from the Insurance Advisory Committee and about the same number of people from the town side, inclu including our, our fine, uh, comptroller and uh, Kay Zogler, who is our benefits manager and our HR manager um, to sort of go through all the things that are, that we um, provide in terms of health insurance. We need to look at plan design. We need to look at whether we should, should stay self-insured or not. We need to look at what, why, if we should continue to offer two plans, both Harvard Pilgrim and Blue Cross. Um, so there's a number of things that we are going to be, we will be going out for re, for bids for reinsurance, we'll be going out for bids for a consultant, everything, we're looking at every way we can save money on this trust, um, or whether the trust should even exist. And so those are fundamental existential questions about the trust that I'm open to any of those, any of the uh, options. Um, there's no romantic uh, uh, connection to the trust, nor to fully insured. I, um, so. I want to have an open discussion with the folks who are um, really have been part of the trust for a long time to see where we go on this. Um, it's a very in, it's going to be an intense group. We th will be meeting weekly for about six weeks uh, because we need to make decisions on what's going to happen next year by the end of February. So it's going to be very concentrated work. Um, in terms of personnel, I'm really proud to have promoted uh, Sergeant Brian Johnson to the rank of lieutenant. Um, he, he's filling the position that was created by the retirement of Lieutenant Jerry Millar. Um, Brian started with the police department in 1997 and has served in numerous capacities. He is promoted to the rank of sergeant in 2008. He's a graduate of UMass and has a master's degree in criminal justice from Anna Maria College. Um, I interviewed eight uh, sergeants from our department who had applied for this and any one of them could have taken this job and we would have been proud to have appointed them. He, he rose to the top both by, by his experience and his um, ability to perform um, on multiple levels uh, but <coughs> it was not an easy decision and is impressed, uh, always impressed by the, the, the um, leadership pipeline that's uh, evident in our departments and I just think it's a real testament to our to the town, the town, type of town that we've chosen to be, and the type of people who chose to, to work for the town. Um, also, um, Jim McPherson was hired as our new facilities maintenance director. He fills the position of Ron Bohanowitz, who has retired. Um, this position is shared 75% paid for by the school, 25% by the town. Um, he is a he has a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. He's an engineer um, with degrees from the University of Virginia and has 30 years experience working for the federal government, anything from shipyards to the U.S. Department of Agriculture to the VA. Uh, a wealth of experience has, has, has been around the block. Is a resident of Pelham, was looking to be working locally instead of traveling as, as much as he was. Um, and so we're really excited to have Jim start. He, his first day was January 3rd, and then this weekend he was out <laughs> handling a lot of issues. Um, 
but uh, he met with all of our staff today uh, to sort of get uh, um, familiar with the people who take care of the police station, the Munson Library, the Bang Center, uh, in this building, and um, so it, it'll it's it's we really miss Ron. Uh, I don't think anybody can replace Ron, but uh, Jim is gonna, is a really strong uh, person who's going to be really good for this for the department. Um, he he also, you know, we've talked a lot about the bigger picture things, like the deferred maintenance. Um, there's a lot of things at the schools that he, we've already identified as deferred maintenance and. I think what we're going to see, and we know, is um, that there's just things that have that we have to invest in in these buildings that are existing buildings. Um, I want to thank Rob Mora um, and uh, people in the building department for filling the gap when Ron wasn't after his retirement wasn't able to work here anymore, and um, he's uh, was tremendous at um, guiding getting some projects moving forward that had been uh, stymied a little bit. Uh, did tremendous work at the schools for their gym floor with the treads at the and on the stairwells. Uh, did some work in the police station, um, and also what's really helpful for that is that he's and he, and he was very rep he represents the town at the Musani Center at the Bank Center. What's really helpful is that now we have two people who've really, I mean, with Jim starting to learn more about our buildings and Rob already knowing a lot about the buildings. There's a little bit of give and take, and I've already seen them sharing information about well what, what what would you do about this or that you know um, I'm thinking of going this way well we should try this thing so it's 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 going it's great to have two people who are going to be working very well together um, Maureen Pollock has been hired as an associate planner uh, and she comes to us from Greenfield and uh, has and is married to another planner in Montague so um, so it's, it's a little planning uh, Pioneer Valley planning community there um, the um, tomorrow is the um, we're having a meeting, a solar meeting, a meeting on the, the solar at the uh, we're trying to call it the, the north landfill because I get confused by the old and new landfills. So <laughs> now I'm trying to say, well, north landfill and south landfill, I can sort of get that. So the proposal <coughs> is to put solar panels on the north landfill and to um, offset the loss of that um, uh, habitat on the south landfill, in which case we'd have to take some action to pr protect that south landfill. There's an information meeting tomorrow night at 6.30 in Town Hall, and we'll talk a little bit about what the plan looks like, what the next steps are, what the permitting requirements are, things like that. Um, looks like a solid plan. We have a good vendor who has worked locally and has served a lot of um, c local communities. Um, who's taking the lead on this project now the Sun Edison has gone bankrupt and so I think that these are all good outcomes and we hopefully can move forward on this the town should be having more solar on our property I think and this seems to be a really logical location I think uh, people before me had really come up with a good solution to sort of address the, um, the the need for habitat of the grasshopper sparrow but also achieve our uh, energy goals um, got a call recently that Senator Ed Markey was asking to have a town hall forum in Amherst and um, we could not accommodate him on a town building so I connected them with the superintendent and so he will be having a forum on January 28th which is a Sunday at 5 p.m. at the middle school and they anticipate about 300 people will show up and that's the day after our regional um, assessment meeting with the four, with the four towns. So you can Mike, mark that on your calendar. I think Mike texted me this afternoon saying that he thought that was a go. Um, I'm guessing the chair might be asked to say a few words um, at the beginning if you're available. Um, and then uh, they usually ask for, we're trying to get a chorus from the high school or middle school or something. To, they'd have someone to do a few songs for them. So uh, mark your calendars for that. Um, and last but not least, I want to announce that um, the assistant to the town manager, Deborah Puppel, has announced her re retirement effective June 8th. Um, this Deborah has been integral to the town since she started here. She was recruited to come here uh, by Mr. Musanti, and um, he lured her away to come and sort of take charge of the operations for the select for the select board and the town manager. And she's done a phenomenal job. Um, 
and she's looking to um, enjoy her her, <laughs> her post retirement life. Although she's promised that she'd continue to offer um, her services, i.e., minutes and other things, and her knowledge to help with uh, transition. So her retirement date is June 8th at this point, um, and that will come sooner than we can anticipate. So. <laughs> that's true that's true um so uh that's a that's a very important search process it's a job that can't go unfilled um as you all know and the, the amount of the amount of work that deborah does just remarkable just remarkable i'm always amazed at the quantity of work that she churns through in the course of a day so uh, i'll miss her personally everybody in town hall is going to miss her and uh but it's a well-deserved um next move for her and that i think summarizes my report Ms. Brewer. would you oh. please talk some about what happened in holyoke because that was after our last meeting and for those people who went away over the holidays we we're so happy about that and they may have missed the press release yes so um we got a uh sort of cryptic uh invitation to come to holyoke city hall to for a um award ceremony and with the lieutenant governor so that usually means good news so obviously we went and by who was invited we sort of figured out what it was about that it was about the beacon project in north amherst and um so uh, select board member brewer and the assistant town manager and i were able to go on relatively short notice actually um and the lieutenant governor was there and uh the um announced that the Beacon Project had received its incentive tax credits, which means that that moves that project to a go, which was a special funding round that, it, that accommodated this, plus about four other projects, one in Cambridge, one in Holyoke, um, a couple others, I think. And so that's a significant amount of money being put into this project um, from the state that allows it to move forward in terms of uh, solidifying their financing. So I think that was a, it was really impressive, um, really exciting to see. And they intend to begin construction or break ground this spring. So they are ready to go. They have their financing set up and th this is going to happen. One other thing I forgot is that at the last meeting, uh, I mentioned that our economic development director had worked with our IT department to come up with a, a sort of a two, a, 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 a little handout. This is not the right way I just sort of Xerox it myself. One side shows where all the restrooms are in the center of town. The other side shows where all the parking is, which is the most common. I call it the park and tea map. Huh? The park and tea map. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, and these are available at the chamber, the bid, and the Jones Library, I believe, and uh, they've distributed this around. We're just, what we're doing is we're just doing this internally. We just copied it and um, put it out there. So if people say, hey, why don't you do this? Why don't you add this to it or something? We can change it on the fly. So I think it makes it pretty simple in terms of um, helping people understand there are, plenty, there are lots of places to park in town. Uh, if you're used to just driving, parking in the Main Street parking lot and it's full, there's lots of other parking spaces that you, places you can find a place to park, so. Thank you. So since it's on this particular one, which I asked for another copy of, because I, I agree with Mr. Brockman, I think we saw it before, but um, I wanted another copy, is when IT's doing all their many things, yep. if one of their conversations is about our branding, we have noticed, well, one, this looks nothing like anything we've ever done before, which doesn't make it bad, it's just we don't have a brand. Yes. And we've talked, you've talked about this before and the blue and the fact that not all of our business cards match and not all of our letterhead matches and obviously there are potential changes afoot anyway. Yep. But if any of the IT's projects are working on branding, one, I would suggest they wait <laughs> like mm -hmm. the other things mm -hmm. and two, that they talk to some elected officials too or some appointed officials on various committees because the last time we did a revamp of the website, the place to work, to play, yeah, work, and live, it's up. like, what? None of us talked about this. And like, we 
drove the situation about the wayfinding signs and stuff into the ground in terms of like the level of detail that was important to us in terms of showing what the town was yep. and a lot of people see that website and so it's fine but just in terms of future practice it seems like just saying somebody comes up with a cool idea should not necessarily just be the way Don't to do it. <laughs> Midtown Motor Inn is what Ms. Brewer I, said. I looked at the Midtown, I was like, this looks a lot like the Midtown Hotels. <laughs> well. But it, it's actually distinctive and it catches yeah. your eye. And so I'm not complaining. I'm saying that as we continue thinking that through, we, we probably, I mean, I know we don't want to have four million meetings about what color right. it should be or something. We've done that already. <clears> but it, it's a little strange how sometimes things just psh, happen. So, so, I mean, in terms of the branding thing, I think it is wise to wait until March to see which, you know, yeah. have the town make a decision about what mm -hmm. it wants to look like, right. and then that, that will inform if we have to change things every, anyway on mm -hmm. some, some issues that makes might may yeah. be the time to do it. But, yeah, I agree with you on that. There isn't any standard protocol for what, it, you know, what's our color that we use for everything and what's the, and right. that type of thing just makes a big difference. Other questions? Well, it's nice to have this. We're going to use it as a little handout for the MMA parking um, workshop that uh, Nate Malloy and I are going to be part of, along with a representative from the town of Franklin and the city of Melrose. Good. Are there other questions for the for the manager regarding his report? Or. Um, so he'll talk separately about the community services oh, yeah. thing. Can we do that now? Uh, we'll okay, but should we stick with the? You want to do that next? Because I had a question about the managers. Is that part of your report? Community services. Yeah, is Can that part of your? That now? Yeah. Well, my my thing is before that. Go ahead. Just um, when you talked about um, is it Phil McPherson? To Jim. The, Jim. Jim. I'm sorry, Jim. I was trying to remember what I look at my notes. Um, as the new. Facilities director, um, certainly miss Ron Bahanowitz, but um, I'm just wondering as part of his orientation, we're almost at the JCPC process and um, it's, it's a, a, a place where the facilities director has a really strong and important role to play and I don't know if um, someone's sort of guiding him or coaching yes. him because that's gonna be an important presence to. Right, so he's got a meeting later this week. We, we have, again, 25% of his time. So he has a meeting later this week with um, uh, Claire and a few other people to sort of go through the entire um, capital projects list and sort of get him ramped up on some of those things. So we want him to participate uh, in those those, ex um, yeah, in those things. He may not be able to contribute as much, but he has he comes with a whole lot of knowledge about things. So. Does he because that person represents the school. A yes. lot of those capital projects are the 75% yes. that's the school side, and then there's the town. And the schools have already involved him in a lot of their planning on about th things that they need done. And they're, they're just facing a lot of capital challenges, too. Roofs, right. for one, yeah. boilers, all kinds of things. We're, we're just right into that season. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I did have to, uh, but if Mr. Steinberg does, I did have some other questions about the town manager's report. But please, I'm taking all the time. Okay, uh, well, I'll be quick on the first one for sure, and that is that um, the um, early in the report you mentioned about uh, the parking um, in the snow mm -hmm. emergency. And one other thing that had uh, crossed my mind is the um, avenue of in, in informing the public um, who frequently park on streets, which are tenants is the uh, using the rental registration program. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Mora had advised uh, the um, Campus and Community Coalition that um, if there's an appropriate thing that is educational to tenants, it can go through that process to landlords and then from landlords to tenants through the registration. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, the other thing, um, I didn't know if there was anything more to say. You had in your written report something about um, what's gone on with presidential, and of course we heard, and didn't know if yes. you, you, you didn't <laughs> say anything more on that as we were giving this report. Right. Uh, if there was any piece you wanted to. Yes. So what uh, I've been informed by the building commissioner is that um, six units have been made available at presidential apartments, which is what is required. Two of them are occupied by new tenants. Four 
uh, remaining units are available as soon as qualifying tenants are identified. And I think that's part of the issue is our, who creates a, who, who constitutes a qualifying tenant. Um, Contrary to what was said earlier today, the building commissioner senses that they're eager to rent these apartments, but they're they're also a business. They want someone who's going to come in with first month's rent, last month's rent, and security deposit. And not a lot of people have that capacity to come up with all that cash, even though they may have an ongoing income that supports a monthly payment. And that's sort of a gap that we've seen in terms of what's needed in the community. Um, the uh, so far, presidential has been fined twenty-eight thousand six hundred dollars by the by the building commissioner and has paid twenty-six thousand nine hundred dollars, uh, and they, so they still owe us a little bit of money there. Um, and then part of the agreement with presidential is that they will be actively participating with DHCD and the Amherst Housing Authority um, to work on the contracts and the agreements that they are supposed to hold hold on to there. Um, so, in, and the building commissioner is, meets regularly with, with the, um, uh, with presidential to make sure things are moving forward. So that's where we stand on that. Th I mean, this is a, few, a couple weeks old, probably. This information. Thank you. <coughs> so, following up on that, I think one of the things we'll want to hear about at a future meeting is particularly with Beacon breaking ground, yep. and we know Beacon has a completely different level of experience associated with these issues, but um, what we learned, basically, from this process this time so that it is more clear yep. as, as things go along the next time. So we, we have sh I've surely learned many things about processes and all the different partners, because as you indicate, there's a lot of different people involved, and how that would be, how we might look at that be really useful for us to have a sense of so that we can continue to tell people and we've learned from this and we know more about it now um, on a completely different note the North Common restoration on page five I appreciate as you said all those different bodies are gonna need to have a say I think it would be incredibly useful to the well I know it would be incredibly useful to the public if especially since all these committees actually do have staff support associated with them which again our staff are incredibly hardworking at all these different meetings in addition to all their other responsibilities if someone could come up with a list of what those meetings are and be able to put out a news and announcements that says the North Common discussion is going to be at Leisure Services Commission on this date it's going to be at Planning Board on this date and it's fine that we don't have the agendas yet mm -hmm. but or even if at this point it's like between this period and this period so people can watch for it yeah. because that way if they can't go to the Leisure Services meeting but they really want to go they can go to the Design Review Board meeting and so that they because just following agendas there's just so much for people yeah. to be achieving track of and this is a big deal we have mm -hmm. done we've been really waiting to get this done and we've had a lot of public input mm -hmm. so far but it was a couple years ago and so I think people just to be brought up to speed I'm not saying they're gonna want to change anything they might, but the idea is to get them to understand what it is we're trying to do because rather than just waiting for them to watch for an agenda and think to show up for that particular meeting I think that would be super helpful yeah I think I think that's I don't think we're quite there yet but I think these are both high-profile projects that people are going to care about and want to be involved in and public involvement is going to be obviously needed for both of them so I think once you know we have a sort of a clearinghouse website or in something where everybody yeah. can plug it in I think that would be a really good idea to do because we have done that before a similar project was several years ago now with Hawthorne and where it was leisure services and Housing and Children Committee and there were different meetings taking place at different times and so Mr. Malloy put together a website that basically said here's where all the stuff is and like you said mm -hmm. a project website that shows we're all the moving and then it links out to all those other yep. things without changing IT's priority yes I know <laughs> I'd like to have a tag on to uh, since you raised the the North Common project um, I know it says in here you know we hope we can start in 2018 but it's really complicated and there's a lot of and that's all true but um, I guess from where I sit on this board I think it would be um, really high priority to try to get it to happen this coming I'm um, talking about the um, the North Commons restoration mm -hmm. project um, it's to some degree also true of Graft Park but I think this is so visible people have waited for so long um, partly sense of momentum mm -hmm. sense of uh, kind of competency to get these projects done and yeah there are a lot of boards and committees but 
is starting a kind of timeline <coughs> roadmap now. I mean, things will always happen that we can't totally predict, but I think it's a really high priority to try to not let it get stuck in the sort of minutia and really make it important that if there's any way possible yeah, that's a really good to point. move it, um, please, please, please. I think it's very important. To add a little bit to that with the bike share coming online this spring, <clears throat> that's you know part and parcel because one of the locations is right there, and we're talking about doing the Main Street lot at the same time. Right. It's Those all go together. And I worry that when we add the other, you know, the... Um, parking area project it makes a lot of sense to combine but then it 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 also can bog it down or so I don't know how to say any more clearly I think it's really important mm -hmm. good it's on my note any other questions or comments for the for the manager on this report all right and if not, then we'll move on to member reports. Unless you no, have something else. No, I, I have, I have so more stuff. Services. Oh, you do have yeah. more. Yeah, that's yes, right. Yes. Sorry, sorry, so sorry. So just yes. as you were talking, this is, I just want, this is not for, I'm just going to hand this around so you can look at it. Those are the, the IT projects. So, there's, so you get a sense of what they're talking about. This is really interesting for them to finally put everything down on paper is what they're challenged by. Um, so, uh, and then a reminder <coughs> that we have our budget uh, presentation on Thursday and uh at that meeting, you'll hear me talk about the revenues that are coming in stronger than we anticipated, primarily because of the um, new growth coming from One East Pleasant, and we, we did not even factor in the new growth anticipated by the Beacon, which will give us substantial new growth as well. Those are important things, and I want to sort of tie in that how that new growth helps support the town's operations, why that's so important. Um, at the same time, you'll hear me talk about um, the need to increase our budgets by more than two and a half percent because of, it's strictly because of the health insurance. Um, so, and um, and it's really important from the school's point of view because they are really experiencing um, very much, very much tight, but very tight budgets because of this, and uh, it's going to mitigate some of the reductions that they have to make, and they will have to make reductions. In addition. Um, we'll be needing uh, probably a request from town meeting for this fiscal year. Previously, I had told you that I don't, I hope that we could manage the budget changes for the current fiscal year, which we would have except for this last increase. And so we're going to continue to manage our budgets. We don't know exactly how much that's going to be because we hope to absorb as much as we can with our existing budgets. So that's a little preview on what you'll hear on Thursday. Um, the Before you go yeah. on, I just have a quick Sure. So related to the insurance question, yeah. Um, one of the items I saw used the term surcharge, which implies yeah. it's not permanent, versus rate increase, which implies it is permanent. Yeah. Um, and I've seen both in both places. Do you know? You sh um, we've never used. It. We've people have asked about surcharge. We've said it's not a surcharge. Okay. It's been there's been a surcharge in the past. Right. And. and, and a surcharge would come into play if there was an actual deficit at the end of the FY18 fiscal year. Then we would have to charge the employees a surcharge to get rid of that deficit. Right. All right. Now I'm just I'm trying to recall if it was something I saw through my you know, other employment or through this <laughs> employment about whether the word surcharge came up. Yeah. I want to say it was through the other. So it may be that that's an important distinction. It is important. Yeah. Um, so it may be. We can't afford to do a surcharge and get the kind of revenue we need and uh, but a lot of people are thinking maybe it should be I mean, so there was a conversation within the insurance advisory committee about some people feeling like we could just put it put in some extra money and then we can take it away and it's like we're not there we have to make fundamental changes to this trust if we're going it's going to survive um, so in your packet also is a, a memo on community services you recall town meeting appropriated sixty thousand dollars for community services and we had initially or I had initially held off on that because of two things. One was I wasn't sure if we were going to have extra needs based on the, the hurricane in Puerto Rico and if we were going to experience any special needs um, because of that. Uh, we've pretty much worked our way through that. We, we think we can uh, see our way to what the impact is going to be on the town. And I don't think there's going to be anything substantial uh, that was going to require extra funding from the town. There, we have a lot of resources already in place, and people have come together in a very, very good way with that. Um, 
and the second was because there wasn't funding available for the um, uh, um, uh, for the Craig stores because the governor had uh, pulled that funding or held that funding, and so obviously that would have been a high priority for the town to maintain its home, the homeless shelter. Um, but when that money came through, um, I was anxious to say, okay, it was already six months into the year. I was anxious to get something out the door. And so um, we had uh, I put together a memo for you, put it in your packet, and now I'm asking you that this is not, we're not quite ready for prime time on this. I apologize that you had it in your packet. Uh, the intent is still the same, that we have a need, we have, we've identified the correct needs. There are some logistical procurement issues that we've run into uh, that makes it not uh, ready for you to have an informed opinion on. Um, I've asked uh, your representatives to come to a meeting on Friday um, so we can talk about this a little bit more and talk with our procurement officials. Um, and it's, it's um, so I think it was in my eagerness to get it moving fast so we could get the money spent this fiscal year so we could so tell me you could see that we were actually spending the money uh, as they requested. Um, I think I moved too hastily. So um, this will come back to you in two weeks uh, at your next meeting. I actually wanted to thank you for having both this, even though it was a, more of a thought piece at this point rather than ready to go, and your town manager's report in our packet Friday. That was hugely beneficial to be able to look at it over. You know, people, we get to a whole weekend to look at this, and so it's it's much nicer than trying to do it sure. when we're here. So really appreciate. I know it takes extra effort and snow days and all snow kinds days of confusion. Snow made it easier, actually. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make sure it snows before the first of every month. Is that the plan? Okay. It's like right. when all the buildings are breaking down. Yeah, that's right. Snow in. <laughs> Thank you. So are there other questions for the manager? If not, then we'll move to, um, to member reports. Would anyone like to go first? Uh, to, to ask to go first simply because there's a segue. I can go back to uh, the town manager report for um, on the item that he circulated for us to just be aware of, which is the IT work list. Uh, I'm aware that as, as a liaison to committees, that several committees at times have talked about wanting to upgrade their websites, and that's actually because of the complexity of that list and the prioritization that needs to take place won't necessarily be the thing that's highest on the list. And I think that it's just important that we um, be clear with um, boards and committees that are trying to get their websites upgraded through the departments to which they're affiliated, fully informed, so that they don't have unreasonable expectations. Um, and uh, the only committee that I'll specifically uh, uh, report on, uh, I was going to report on the uh, um, transfer station and uh, recycling issues from my liaison to that committee, but um, there was good material within the packet that was provided that really provided um, sort of the same information that Ms. Kaplan provided to that committee, which led to a very healthy discussion there. Um, and uh, the last thing that I wanted to do is clarify something that came up at the last meeting and uh, with the uh, explanation quickly for those who weren't aware and uh, uh, an apology to Ms. Brewer. And uh, the, there was a change in the law and I think that what we had um, sort of between the two of us had kind of missed um, the fact that, the, the, that because of statutory, statutory changes that um, the uh, Attorney General therefore revised the rule around um, the op um, remote participation under open meeting law for disability commissions. And um, uh, in uh, trying to do the research and figure out what happened, um, I never had to actually make a phone call because I found the statutory revision and the provision that they were therefore implementing in doing that. And I think that that's um, what I uh, wasn't aware of at the time we had the last discussion at the meeting. I have 
uh, advised by email the our disability access advisory committee um, where this all had arisen that um, there had been a change in the statute and therefore the regulation and therefore the I gave them the correct information um, so that they would have it for them. I wanted to ask Mr. Steinberg a question. We had materials in our packet about the recycling coordinator, but it's just <coughs> in there and I wasn't, I mean, were we supposed to talk about it? Is it just an FYI? Because who decides that we're going to, particular, what caught my attention, who decides that there is going to be fines for the recycling and who institutes that and who's in charge of that? Because that was kind of a hot topic when we were looking at that position and guessing it's not up to the refuse and recycling committee to do that on their own. No, I think that that's actually a Board of Health regulation that um, provides for the fines and the question of uh, having an enforcement mechanism I mean, is, is also covered in the Board of Health regulations, which uh, itself, um, and those are not new, and those are included in the packet information. Um, you know, I thought that that was uh, intended to be informative so that we would know what was happening with Ms. Kaplan's position, the fact that Ms. Kaplan also went to that particular committee and gave essentially the same report and that they discussed it at the same length and had a very good exchange because they're so familiar with the issue. But it was, uh, you know, absolutely 100% consistent with the material that was presented to us already, so I didn't feel the need to go into it any further. Well, um, I hadn't seen all of the material that was there assembled in the way it was until we received it in the pack, and Mr. Bachman would have to. Oh, you're saying her presentation, I'm sorry, her, her presentation, presentation was consistent with what's in our packet. Her presentation was consistent with okay. what she reported in, our, in so the memo in our packet. You, just to be clear, you're saying that the imposition of fines um, that could happen after this initial education period would be under the purview of the Board of Health, and it's not ours to comment on? It's um, implementing a Board of Health regulation that provides for the fines. Uh, Ms. Kaplan um, said very clearly to the committee in the discussion was is that going to fines is the absolutely, is not the first, it's the last thing to do. The um, education um, and uh, providing information to homeowners and to um, let people know where there are, uh, where she identifies problems with compliance uh, for educational purposes is her initial goal. She does not want to go to fines initially, and that's what that was the discussion in the committee. And I think that was fairly consistent with what she said in her her memo. So I, that's what the consistency I was talking about. It's not how I read the memo. Mr. Brewer, did you? Have, yeah. So, I said we'd be done <laughs> by 9 o'clock. Oh, so, um, following up on that particular issue, people familiar with our meetings are familiar with the fact that I was extremely put out that, this dis that the decision was made to move on with this grant-funded position without a check-in back with the select board because we did have a number of concerns, mainly located around the fining issue. The Board of Health um, does, of course, and has had for years now the ability to do that. I think it would be useful to know now that we have this position how many of those fines have actually been imposed over the past few years, and I'd like to see the difference between owner-occupied homes versus an apartment complex somebody's been working with or a restaurant or we have very little manufacturing but a business because when people see this they worry you know and she did very clearly say I'm not going to go through your trash bags but um, it makes people nervous and certainly the intent we know is educational and probably I mean I wouldn't be surprised at all if the Board of Health hasn't fined anybody but if there's going to be a change, and then I think that, you know, this was good that this went out because it's warning people, hey, here's what's really going on. But also just because we've had fines and we haven't imposed them doesn't mean that 
we can't start imposing them now. And I will point out that depending on your interpretation of page five, it says any owner dot, dot, who violates in the 5% rule can be fined a minimum of $50 and not more than $500 for each week of such violation. I'm quite confident the Board of Health would not choose to, uh, to fine me $500 a week for putting too much pizza box that they think should be recycled, but I don't, um, in the trash. But it, it's a pretty, there's a lot of leeway there. And I think that given that we haven't had somebody, we've had people in the past who worked on the educational standpoint. We've not had someone, to my knowledge, working on actually imposing fines. I just think we just need to be careful about how we continue to manage. And, and this outreach letter was a good start, although not everybody gets a paper water bill and not everybody reads the inserts that come with the paper water bill. So um, there probably needs to be additional mm -hmm. outreach about that. But I think that our experience in the past and other places has indicated that you know it's we want to make sure apartment complexes have places to recycle more so than that she's going down the street and finding one or two multi one or two student rentals that didn't get the message about this because we're not trying to penalize people per se we're trying to just get everybody to do the right thing so um, I would hope that the Board of Health would think about how they're coming across associated with this since it is their rules that the fines could be done under having some data of if we've ever actually find anybody or if we've had to over the years and then also the knowing that the person's working with the chamber in the bid because again the educational part of it so that we can say oh everybody's working together we're trying because that's what we're trying to do we're not trying to get people in trouble we're just trying mm -hmm. i think you know, just to, to build on that you know there's larger apartment complexes but also i think the rental registration you know, one of the ways we can leverage that information is to reach out to those mm -hmm. property owners that are uh, on that list as well because they, they have a lot of influence over their tenants and, and what their tenants know or don't right. know or mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And, you know, certainly, you know, the, there are lots of uh, companies that work with multiple right. places. They may not own an apartment complex, but they may have multiple homes that have multiple right. tenants that... They could have a consistent message to all of them, uh, which would be helpful as well. Um, anything else on that before we go to other member reports? Any, any, Ms. Burr, do you have anything? I have a couple things, but if you I can. just wanted to mention quickly that I asked for this stuff to be put in here because it's one of those things that I don't know how the public's supposed to know that they're allowed to have an opinion if we don't stick it in our packet. But Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, I know the information's been forwarded on to our Pioneer Valley Planning Commission rep, which is Jack Jemsek from Planning Board. And also the TAC has received the information about the bridge reports. But it's just, again, just keeping information circulating so they can't say later they didn't know. But I don't imagine that we have the desire to necessarily have a conversation at a select board meeting about Pioneer Valley Planning Commission's plans, but if we do, like now we know we could. Right. Do you have something coming on that? All right. So I'll just go through the couple of things I have. Um, just to touch back on a thing that the manager mentioned, he and I had gone down to um, a meeting that PVTA actually called with legislators uh, to talk about budget concerns they have because they have some considerable budget concerns, not surprisingly. Um, but we had it. We took that opportunity to take a few minutes with the with the director and their opera, their new operations director to talk about the the B43, which is the bus that runs back and forth between Amherst and, and Northampton. Um, and you know, long story short, MassDOT was doing a planning process and kind of working independently, for better or worse, around the idea of moving people quickly. And so they suggested things that are a long way from being fully discussed. I think the the PVT has a very prescriptive process they have to go through in order to to make any change to any route. And so. Uh, they have much more pressing immediate concerns, um, and you know whether or not there'll be any changes to B43 will will be coming through that process. Probably less so in the immediate budget constraints, but certainly not uh, uh, off the agenda completely necessarily. There may be some, um, you know, as we go through that budget process with PVTA. Um, there'll be a lot of other tough decisions about all sorts of routes that will need to be made throughout the Piner Valley on, on, on and not just the B43. So 
but people do have a lots of opportunity. The process is such that people have lots of opportunity to, to, to weigh in and, and express their concerns. Um, one other thing I'll mention is the BCG is going to have its first meeting tomorrow morning. Um, where we'll all get together for the first time and uh, share sort of where everyone is regarding their budget development. Um, that's in this room at 8.30, mm -hmm. I believe. Um, and the third thing I'll mention is the Housing Trust, uh, the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust uh, has, has met, and we have some subcommittees. There's one on policy. Uh, we are putting together um, some goals uh, relative to policy, uh, you know, targets for housing, that sort of thing. And the idea is that that actually will go out to uh, us, the planning board, uh, the trust itself will, you know, approve them, but also want the select board to approve them, the planning board to approve them, uh, and so it, sooner rather than later, but probably a month or so away, we'll see those surface and we'll be able to read through them and provide our feedback back to the trust about what we think about them. Um, but the goal is to have this series of goals and targets uh, with a number of boards on board with that and, and committing to sort of uh, working toward those, those goals. So I just want to give you a, uh, a little bit of awareness of that process is, is moving, and so there's going to be some things coming to us uh, with some, some uh, you know, concrete things we're going to try to do from an affordable housing standpoint. Um, and I think that's it for me as far as things I wanted to mention. Well, is that anything else? No. Um, I will mention that we are meeting on Thursday at 4 o'clock in this room, right? Mm -hmm. And that our uh, agenda for that is in our packet. And unless there's something else regarding this evening, yes. Oh, thank you. We did get in our on our desk this evening uh, a letter from a townsperson as well as from uh, the 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 mayor of Searle. I'm not sure if that's the I don't know Italian. So it's an Italian community uh, in northern Italy that has reached out to us and perhaps is interested in a sister city uh, arrangement. So I think we'll have to, uh, to look at this a little more closely. Um, if memory serves, generally town meeting, or do we, or can it be either one? I'm not sure. So yes, town meeting. Yes, the last one we added, we never managed to actually fully populate in terms of developing a quorum and the members who had asked for it to happen actually asked that it be disbanded and, um, you know, which is not something we generally take back to town meeting in a situation like that. We've taken other committees to town meeting. My, I mean, obviously we're just reading this tonight, but when I was glancing at it during the break, I um, believe that we should say something because obviously you know we don't want to not respond but i think it would be much better to wait until after the election i do not think we should put anything on the annual town meeting warrant because we have had we we have had difficulty managing the sister city relationships we have now with wonderful intentions just not enough person time to go around to make everything happen and i'd hate to say well yeah, let's just do it because then we say we did it but to actually do it adequately and fall town meeting would be perfect it seems like it, it's not like they have a big anniversary coming up or something that we can see here so it seems like fall town meeting would be a perfectly adequate time and I don't disagree with what with what Ms. Brewer said but um, just process wise if we're going to talk about it we probably need to at least put it on to have the discussion and I think it maybe goes well in the context of looking at our sister cities which we've attempted many times and i'm speaking now from the the point of view of um, a person who's worked on the committee appointment process we do have some issues in general with how we're managing those committees and so um i think we we would have to consider this in the context of that and i also agree the timing issue is sort of a cover for we can't do it's not appropriate to initiate something like that now anyway even if we were interested but I don't know how we get to talk about it at our meeting unless we put it on an agenda. I think it's like any other piece of mail. Some mail we don't ever put on our agenda. We didn't well, put but if we're making a decision, but we're, but we're making a decision about to do something or not do something. So that's not exactly like any other piece of mail. So I would, what I would suggest is the following, is that uh, being seen what's likely to be on our, our agenda for the 22nd, it'll be pretty full, so I'm not thinking this, but maybe 
some fairly soon thereafter, we can have a conversation about what response we would write back to them to, to just explain the circumstance so we don't wait six months and then right. they've forgotten right. all about it. Right. So we could write a letter of, of explanation like, here's where we are as far as considering this, mm -hmm. um, you know, that sort of thing. But I think we can, in a few weeks, not next time That's we fine. meet, we might have that conversation yeah. on our agenda. And so, yeah. you know, sort of shape our response to them first and then figure out after the election in March and those sorts of things, whether or not we'll go more deeply into it. So that's what I would suggest, and we maybe can approach that yep. that way. Yeah, let's just make sure we don't forget it, because it's easier. Exactly. Well, we've got that nice Google Doc now. That's right. Yeah, which I haven't even looked at. Google Sheet. Yeah, that's right. Right, the docs or so, words. Right. That's the old term, sorry. Right. I'm dating myself. <laughs> just don't call it a parking lot. <laughs> So barring any other topic we need to bring up, I would take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 It's at 916.